The Honourable Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise uh, here in the House again today. Uh, I'd like to welcome those in the gallery. It's always good to see faces here. Um, I'd like to say hello to everyone in District 4, Belfast, Mary River. I know that we're all uh, waiting for spring, although uh, the ground did get quite a bit of snow last night. But as, as I say, poor men's fertilizer, and I think most farmers are going to be happy with that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the UPI Women's Panthers basketball team were awarded the only wild card entry into the 2022 U Sports Women's Basketball Finals, eight national championships, which will run from Thursday to Sunday at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. The Panthers, Panthers finished first place during the uh, AUS conference regular season play. The full broadcast schedule will be available throughout the tournament at usports.ca slash en slash broadcast. Go Panthers, go. There's go. <laughs> uh, uh, PEI performer Logan Richard of Charlottetown was named to the first up with RBCX Music Program as one of the 19 Canadian performers. The program showcases emerging mu musicians and recording artists from across Canada, giving them performance opportunities, media and uh, promotional marketing support, and access to its network of industry partners. And lastly, Mr. Speaker, Islanders of the Muslim faith are preparing to celebrate Ramadan this year. The community will be able to gather in person for the first time in two years. Um, community members will be collecting non-perishable food items and assembling 15 to 20 food baskets weekly to distribute to local families in need. And I can honestly say that for uh, all the Muslim community, it is such a wonderful thing that they can celebrate and break the fast together. And uh, to all the Muslims here on PEI and throughout the world, uh, Ramadan Kareem or Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today, and I too would like to welcome everybody in the gallery. It is lovely to see faces in here again, or most of faces, I should say, half of faces. Thank you for being here. Um, I'll, I'll pick up on what the Deputy Premier just uh, said about Ramadan, and there was a, that lovely story on CBC this morning um, about the expansion of the mosque in Charlottetown. Of course, um, Muslims here on Prince Edward Island have been here for some time, but in small numbers, and they used to meet in the basement of each other's houses to, to pray and to celebrate and to practice their faith. And now they have a beautiful new mosque uh, with a capacity of 300 people, and it's been finished just in time for this year's Ramadan, and just in time, as the Deputy Premier said, for them to gather in person uh, for Ramadan this year, and, and that's, a, that's a beautiful thing. So. Um, I want to congratulate all of the Muslims here on Prince Edward Island and, um, and echo some of the things that Zain Eskire and Najam Chisti said this morning. And, you know, they talked about how COVID has impacted us all, of course, but for the Muslim community particularly, it uh, made it difficult for them to practice their faith, to meet, to pray, and, and for them to have community meals, which is such an important part of that faith tradition. And so with this extra space, they can now accommodate, again, 300 people. And, and they have a basement, too, which will allow them to have um, all kinds of other events. So as, uh, you know, as the Deputy Premier said, I, I, too, say Ramadan Mubarak to all of our PEI friends and neighbors here from the Muslim community and, and, and around the world. And I hope you have a really wonderful Ramadan. 4S Catering is a very special uh, family, the Sunnils, who have really contributed to our community in so many different ways over the relatively short time that they've been here. And they are moving into a permanent location to set up uh, their own kitchen. And they're going to do that at the Jack Blanchard Hall, where they'll be able to prepare takeout meals for people. And of course, they. They volunteer in so many ways in our community, and they, they were the driving force behind the community fridge just down the road from where their new kitchen will be. And um, I encourage everybody, I mean, apart from anything else, the food is delicious. They, they cook beautiful stuff. But you know, if you want to support um, a local family who are really giving back in an enormous disproportionate way, um, please consider uh, heading down to the Jack Blanchard Hall and, and buying some stuff from 4S Catering. And finally, um, 
Sputnik 1 is about to blast into outer orbit later this year, and it's a project uh, a collaboration between UPEI and the Canadian Space Agency, and it's been on the go since 2018. And Sputnik 1 is uh, a little, pretty small. I, I, it's been described as the size of two Rubik's cubes, but I prefer two decent-sized uh, Russet Burbanks because oh. it's there to, once it gets up in space, it's going to be taking pictures of the agricultural land here on Prince Edward Island um, to help with precision agriculture. And that's a really burgeoning part of how we do agriculture now to know where we need more fertilizer or less fertilizer, or where there may be irrigation issues or too much water, too little water, and it can spot diseases in plants from outer space. Absolutely incredible piece of technology. So congratulations to um, Grant McSorley, who's the assistant professor at UPEI, who's been running this, and a whole bunch. I think there's been 30 or 40 students along the way who've had their hands on this. But particularly, I want to make note of Josh O'Neill, who's a master's student at UPEI, and he's been there since the very beginning. So happy travels, Sputnik 1. Thank you, Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, too, would like to say it's great to be back here today and welcome everyone to the gallery. I'd like to make a, say a special welcome to, a, or hello, to a good friend of mine, John Gillis, who I had the pleasure to visit with on Saturday, and he tells me he watches the proceedings whenever he can. So hello, John. Mr. Speaker, I too would like to wish the Muslim community a wonderful Ramadan celebrations that are coming up. I wish them all the best. And Mr. Speaker, tonight is the final concert of the Evangeline Bluegrass Festival, and Janet McCary and her band, Wellwood, will be performing. Janet is a multi-award winning bluegrass performer, including a five-time winner of the Eastern Canadian Bluegrass Music Female Artist of the Year Award. The show will open for everyone online at the Evangeline Bluegrass Festival page, and it starts at 7 p.m., and I wish everyone a Happy evening. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm just going to uh, first welcome everyone, and you may notice a little bit of a difference in my appearance. And no, no. it's not the suit. No. I wear the suit quite regularly. Um, but I do have a, a little bit of a color under my eye. Uh, a lot of my peer group thought, Mr. Speaker, was because I was telling jokes on the weekend, and it was nothing to do with that. Um, as you may know, I play with the uh, I play in the Queens County Hockey League, a great league that was run by uh, Jared Doucette for years, and now run by Chris Hadafine. Um And I, I want to talk, Mr. Speaker, quickly, if you'll uh, indulge me, uh, just about the kindness of the league and the players, and all of the uh, the help that went through this. So I was playing a game. I played with the Merchant Man Silverbacks and playing the Gahan Flyers, and we ended up getting into a little bit of a race for a puck, and of course an errant stick came up and hit me in the eye. Um, it's funny too, Mr. Speaker, because the referees that night were Colin Myers and Thane Arsenault, two great guys, and uh, not everyone will say that Thane Arsenault is a great referee, but I will. Um, and anyway, uh, so Thane was very great. He texted me at the end of the game to check on me, and then they had another game, and he texted me after that when I went to the hospital, and a bunch of the guys in the Gahan Flyers uh, you know, also texted to see, just to see, make sure I was doing all right. And I do want to say hello to uh, my buddy Nick LaPlante, who uh, was kind of the makeshift uh, trainer to make sure that I was uh, covered up enough that I could make it to the eight. ER. But the last thing I do want to mention, Mr. Speaker, is at the emergency room, it was a busy night on Monday night. Um, I, I can't say enough great things about the staff there. Uh, you know, of course, everybody who's in the, the emergency room and waiting and there, you know, they think that theirs is the most pressing issue. But the nurse manager came out at one point in time and she just said, I, I want to, uh, you know, everyone who's here, uh, we are dealing with a busier night tonight, but, you know, uh, we just ask for your patience. And I just thought that was very nice. And uh, lastly, of course, thanks to the uh, nurse, uh, Adrian, who uh, helped clean me up, and the doctor, Dr. Brown, who uh, put nine stitches in. And Mr. Speaker, as a former hockey player, you might find this line funny. Uh, Dr. Brown said to me when I came in, and he said, so you're playing hockey? I said, yes, sir. And he said, were you wearing a mask? And me not wanting to say that I wasn't wearing a mask, but wanting to say that I was wearing a mouth guard, I said, no, uh, but I was wearing a mouth guard. And he's like, that's great. I'm not a dentist, I'm a doctor. <laughs> so anyway, just a reminder to anyone who does play recreational hockey, it's maybe not a bad idea to throw a visor or a cage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise. Um, and as everybody in this House knows, I've been rising over the last couple of weeks and sharing when we're short of ambulances. And I had a number of phone calls from Islanders last night who were sharing their story of their experience, including a child who took three hours to actually get them to the hospital when transfers and everything like that needed to happen. One, um, one interesting p piece of this was on Saturday, I was informed of a code critical at 1156, and they were fully staffed on Saturday, which was an anomaly. It, usually, it doesn't happen that way. And there were quite a few that were actually working for that double time that was offered from Medivy that they spoke about. But they actually gave me a breakdown of what all those ambulances were doing at the time of when we didn't have any ambulances across the province available for emergency calls at that time. So four of them were out of province doing, um, doing transfers, two were doing routine pickups, and two were doing st um, stat critical uh, transfers. So that's just an idea of how much hustle our paramedics have on a daily basis when they're working, and it's constant for them. And uh, I wanted to share that just so that we recognize, like, they are hustling out there, and um, we definitely need to look at, you know, how we're supporting them because they need that help. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Monaco, Kilmuir, and the Government Women. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. A pleasure to rise today. And Welcome back to all my colleagues, as well as uh, Adine McDonald um, from my district, who usually says she watches along on East Link. So hello to her. I'd like to recognize in the gallery uh, Mo McCabe and Hubert McIsaac. Um, Mo's would be a longtime uh, supporter of the party and a good volunteer. So welcome to the gallery. And also a constituent of mine, Ronnie Nicholson, is uh, here with us today. Ronnie's also president of the board at Lennon House. So thank you for all the work you do, Ronnie, and uh, thanks for stopping in to watch the proceedings. And Ronnie's wife, Jeannie, is uh, the reason why my hair looks so good. So, <laughs> <laughs> although I think Ronnie might have forgot to comb his today. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, welcome, to the, welcome to the gallery, and uh, it's good to have you here. <laughs> Did I miss anyone? The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just a brief greeting um, to extend my congratulations to the 10 women entrepreneurs who were the recent recipients of the PEI Business Women's Association microgrants. Microgrants were established in 2016. Um, and since that time annually, they have awarded grants of up to $500 to help women who have a, a business that are either starting or growing that business. Many people didn't think it would work because they didn't think $500 would make a difference. Mr. Speaker, it does. And uh, these 10 women are recipients this year, so congratulations to them. Thank you. Miss anyone else? No? <coughs> well, not very often that I get a chance to get on my feet, which I do miss. But I wonder, can Jeannie uh, make hair grow? <laughs> if she can, she got a new customer. But you know, when you get into politics, you meet a lot of people across, you know, your province. Not only, you know, not only your province, but right uh, across Canada. But I've met some real good friends over the years in my in my uh, 11 years in politics. And uh, Ronnie Nicholson is uh, one of them, a great friend. And anytime I'm in Monaco, I don't know why. The, the good Lord up above must put us in the same room and we, we have a little chat. And uh, Mo, Mo McCabe, I got to uh, know uh, Mo through uh, politics. But one fella I, I got to meet, and this is years and years and years ago, is Hubert McIsaac. And boy, was Hubert ever good to uh, his community of St. Peter's and the hockey community. Hubert was uh, one of the guys that started the Eastern Kings Hockey League in uh, St. Peter's. Not only in St. Peter's, in Kings County. He was uh, the driving force uh, behind it. And I got to know, uh, you know, the old St. Peter's Pioneers days. And, you know, actually my uh, father had a team named after him, the Basils, uh, the Bye Bye Radars, you know. And these were all big teams back in the day. Like we had, uh, we had uh, boat haulers or we had uh, uh, the Sharks of our day. You know, there was always big teams that came up through. Well, we always forget about the, the days of the St. Peter's Pioneers and the Basil's Radars and the, the Surrey Legions and, you know, the big teams. Like, as generations uh, 
get older, we forget about the uh, the older teams in Hubert. Uh, it's good to be a friend of yours over the years, and it was good to know you. You're full of uh, knowledge, you're full of uh, history, and uh, I just want to thank you for that. Not very often I'll get up in the house and uh, meet you here every day to uh, thank you, but public, I want to thank you. Thank you very much for your knowledge. Member statements. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, and the Opposition Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Soon after being elected, I was contacted by a constituent who lives near a shoreline area where some have been bringing their dogs and allowing them to run loose for years, often onto this person's property. This may seem like no big deal other than the unpleasant inconvenience of dog poop being left in someone's yard. <laughs> However, there are also genuine concerns about unpredictability and potentially aggressive behaviors when a dog encounters a stranger, either in a private or public uh, property, making those in the area feel unsafe. This is particularly concerning for the elderly and for those with children. In this case, the current Dog Act provides no clear direction on how issues of loose dogs are managed in municipalities without corresponding bylaws many of uh, which our smaller municipalities simply don't have. There really is no recourse uh, to address my constituents' concerns and keep people safe. Since then, I have heard from several others who have experienced similar issues. There are many gaps in the current Dog Act that need to be addressed, both for the well-being of animals and for the safety of islanders. My colleague, the leader of the official opposition, was the first to bring forward these concerns in the legislature. Again and again, for years, we have been promised changes are coming. For over two years now, sitting after sitting, I have relayed the message from the Minister of Justice and Public Safety to my constituents that a new dog act is coming and that their concerns will finally be addressed. And sitting after sitting, I have to call them back and say I'm sorry. I don't know why it hasn't come forward yet. Hopefully next time. Finally. I was considering that. Finally, early, <laughs> earlier this month, a consultation draft of the new Dog Act that would replace the old outdated uh, Dog Act was made available for public consultation. However, the draft does not actually deal with many critical issues, including the issue of municipal jurisdiction. I sincerely hope the significant gaps in the proposed legislation will be fixed immediately and then after all this time, this sitting will be the sitting when I can call my constituents and say, yes, finally, <laughs> new legislation that actually addresses their concerns have been tabled, it has been tabled and passed. I really, really, really don't want to have to call them all back again and say again that this government continues to delay and they will have to face another summer feeling unsafe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Summerside, South Drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over and over I hear from constituents whose finances are being stretched beyond the breaking point. Housing prices, fuel prices, food prices, electricity prices, and, and on and on. The bills keep piling up, and the solution is obvious, to get more money into the pockets of islanders, Mr. Speaker. We could raise the minimum wage. This government raised it by 70 cents, not even close to enough. Let's start talking in terms of a li livable wage. We could bring in basic income guarantee. I've yet to see any real pressure from this government to see this come to fruition. Just underwhelming pilots. We could lower electricity rates. Government takes in 10 million a year from ratepayers. This government fought against and voted against legislation I brought to this floor that would have helped provide inexpensive clean energy to islanders, instead siding with the utility. Mm -hmm. We could intervene in the housing crisis with policies that grant stability to renters and landlords alike. Yeah. Yet government has delayed coming forward with essential legislation that could do so, mm -hmm. leaving islanders to struggle to find a place to live. We could have a huge push into publicly owned housing and cooperatives through request RFPs and partnering with the many federal programs that will help us fund the projects. The efforts here have been underwhelming, to say the least, blaming the industry for an inability to respond. Issue the RFPs. When they come back empty, maybe then you can point to that as your excuse. <coughs> Without those RFPs, it's government's failure. It's been years and the damage is already done to many who are now housing insecure. We can rebate all of the carbon revenues collected to islanders, Mr. Speaker. Instead, government sees fit to keep more of that revenue from islanders' pocketbooks as well. The culmination of these failures 
is the cost of living crisis we find ourselves wrestling with now. Islanders need more than just Dr. Morrison's leadership through the pandemic. They need leadership that's doing its job and taking care of the pressing issues facing Islanders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. STEAM PEI is a non-profit organization dedicated to inspiring young Islanders to pursue learning and careers in science, technology, engineering, art, and math. It fosters curiosity and builds excitement for the sciences at an early age through hands-on learning while also developing the competencies that, that are like critical thinking, communication, and creativity, building talent to meet the future needs of Canada's workforce. Founded in 2018 by my fellow UPEI MBA alumni and CEO Amber Jadis, STEAM PEI offers after-school classes, week-long summer camps, day-long PD camps, and in-school workshops that are matched to specific curriculum outcomes in partnership with the public schools branch. Amber says, at STEAM PEI, we strive to reach all PEI students, especially girls, indigenous students, and students from low socioeconomic backgrounds who are traditionally underrepresented in STEM fields. And Mr. Speaker, as somebody who has always been in a field where I was often the only woman in the room, whether that be in engineering, um, in, as a computer programmer, as a field engineer, um, or even as an executive, um, I, I can speak to how important it is to have that support from an early age and be encouraged to go into spaces where you are not welcome or expected to be. And STEAM fills that space, Mr. Speaker. A couple of weeks ago, there was an exciting funding announcement that may have slipped by many in this House. ACOA and the province have made a significant investment for development of the STEAM PEI Creativity Centre at the Elnoe Apekwik Assembly of Council Building down on the waterfront. This beautiful new space on the ground floor is fully accessible and includes a kitchen, a maker space, classrooms, offices, and will serve as a base for continued mobile program delivery as well as on-site programming in a safe, welcoming and diverse environment. I had the opportunity, along with my daughter, to pop into the centre this weekend for a sneak peek at that space and play with some of the equipment, including robot, robot that were remote controlled, couldn't get my daughter to put them down. Um, it's an inspiring space, and even without everything that we'll eventually offer, the creative and diverse team will make it an exceptional one, I know. Congratulations to Amber, her board of directors, and her staff, and I look forward to returning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of member statements. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. No? For a first question, I'll call on the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. In each and every sitting of this House, I ask about the status of a full-time GP in the Crapo Health Clinic. Some residents of the South Shore are now able to access primary care locally, and that's great. But despite re repeated commitments from a number of different governments along the way to establish a full-time doctor in Crapo, nothing has yet materialized. A question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. When can people in the South Shore region expect to see a full-time family physician in the Crapple Clinic? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member uh, for the question. As uh, we've uh, talked about here over the last uh, number of, uh, of weeks, uh, Mr. Speaker, we will be moving and are moving towards medical homes. And there will be an announcement coming out on that shortly, Mr. Speaker, which uh, I would uh, hope, uh, certainly anticipate, that the Honourable Member will be uh, pleased with. But uh, we'll have to wait until that time to see what his reaction may be. But with that, uh, as I say, Mr. Speaker, that will be coming shortly, uh, the details of that announcement. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks so much, Mr. Speaker. I mean, I'm often thrilled with the announcements that come from this minister and government, but it's the implementation of the laws that doesn't, doesn't always thrill me quite so much. The recent announcement that uh, nurse practitioner John Miller would be joining the health clinic in Crapo was really welcome news to all of those who live in the area and that they've experienced many, many years of inadequate local access to primary health care. I just want to diverge and say congratulations to John, his wife Rebecca, on the birth of their first child, Eli, just a couple of weeks ago. Fantastic news. A question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. 
it's still unclear to me, and you sort of referenced this in your first answer, and most islanders also are unclear on this, exactly what medical homes and neighborhoods are. But can you confirm today that the Crapo Clinic is what you envisage a medical home to be? The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, thank the Honourable Member for the question. I have to admit I uh, missed the part there that the Honourable Member had uh, uh, put forward that caused a bit of a chuckle throughout the House. So maybe uh, afterwards he could share that information with me. I'd certainly appreciate that. Uh, but uh, with that, uh, as I said in answer to my first question, uh, or the question from the Honourable Member, Leader of the Official Opposition, that with regard to the medical homes, medical neighborhoods, and just what areas uh, will be encompassed, starting off with, uh, with the homes, uh, that announcement will be coming shortly, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I really would hate to preclude one area and not uh, mention the others in that time period. Thank you. Donovan Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and that's fair. Uh, one service that has been continued in Crapo, despite gaps in many other areas uh, in, in the region, was blood collection. And that was in part due to investments made, made by the South Shore House um, Home, sorry, Health and Wellness Inc., um, the pharmacy there uh, uh, in Crapo. Currently, only patients who are associated with that practice are able to access blood work in Crapo. For all of the others who live in the area, they have to travel to get that service, typically to a hospital. To the Minister, when will all residents of the South Shore region have blood work services available locally so they don't have to travel to an island hospital for this basic service? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank uh, the Leader of the Opposition. It's an excellent question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll go back to uh, the Department and back to Health PEI, get that information, uh, bring it back to the House. But as soon as I do have that information, Mr. Speaker, I will share it immediately with the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. John, the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, there's been a lot of talk in the House, of course, on health care services across our island, and particularly the paucity of health care services in rural areas. And access to health care services in rural PEI has been declining for years. It's not something new, but it's certainly accelerating, and it's a big concern for those of us on this side of the House. The current government is still telling rural islanders to travel outside their region to access primary health care services. We had questions on this yesterday. We're seeing frequent closures of rural ERs. Wait times for ambulances in rural communities, if they're available at all, are completely unacceptable, and rural islanders are sometimes quite literally paying with their lives. Mm -hmm. To the same minister, why are you still cutting back health care services in rural Prince Edward Island? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and with all due respect to the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Speaker, we are not cutting back services to islanders in rural communities. You look at, Mr. Speaker, you look at the initiatives that were put forward in the capital budget last year with regard to a new, a new Kings County Memorial Hospital, with regard to health clinics, community health centers that are being built in our rural communities. You look at the additional 9.6 FTE family doctors that were in the operational budget last year, with a certain number of them being allocated, Mr. Speaker, to our rural communities. I had referenced yesterday with regard to Western Hospital, Mr. Speaker, the additional in this budget, when we do get it passed, of 5.1 FTE additional nurses at Western Hospital. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, we are not cutting back in services to rural islanders. Thank you. Member from Mermaid Stratford. Mr. Speaker, the Medivy Island EMS contract was initiated under the former Bins Conservative government and remained in place until 2016. The contract is auto-renewed for six years with little evidence that the private company is meeting the needs of Islanders. This government has had three chances to renegotiate a better contract for Islanders and paramedics, but hasn't bothered to do it. Question to the Minister. Do you think this contract is still adequately, serv adequately servicing Islanders, especially those living in rural communities? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the member uh, for the question. Uh, with regard to the contract, she is absolutely right to go back to 1996. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you look at uh, the services that were provided before that, that were provided privately. Uh, certainly the ones that I'm aware of are up in the western part of the province, Mr. Speaker, where Ferguson's funeral home also had Ferguson's ambulance, where you had Rooney's funeral home also had Rooney's ambulance. We have came a ways from that, without a doubt. Uh, but there is always room, and we do have to strive for improvement. And I agree 100% with the honorable member that we do have to make improvements there and that we are working towards that, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I had alluded to some of uh, the initiatives uh, previously or the last two, three days. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mermaid Stoffer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So Section 3.7 of the contract requires Medivy to assure that advanced life support is available on every ambulance. This means at least one advanced care paramedic in every ambulance. This is not happening. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. What is the penalty to Medivy if they are not meeting the advanced life support requirement in their contract with this government? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And with regard to uh, the Honourable Member's uh, question, uh, uh, advanced care paramedics, I'll be honest, I have reviewed the contract. I have not focused on the exact uh, uh, area of that contract that the Honourable Member has uh, referenced. I will certainly, I'll go back, take a look at that, and bring back information on that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mermaid Stuffer. That's concerning, Mr. Speaker, because that's Section 3.7. And Medivy Island EMS was required to come into compliance in 2007. So the fact that you don't know that they're actually meeting that not meeting that requirement is super concerning because the level of care matters. Mr. Speaker, imagine your loved one calls 911. They're having a seizure. The paramedics that arrived are trained with basic level of care. That's a PCP paramedic. Um, but the, uh, sorry, but the paramedics that arrive, they're only trained in the basic level of care, um, and they need an advanced care paramedic to administer the medication that will stop the seizures. They have no option but to load up the patient in and drive to the closest hospital, hoping for the best, knowing how critical that time is. Mr. Minister, the, con the contract calls for advanced life supports because it saves Islanders' lives. Why are you intent on auto-renewing a contract with a private company that is putting Islanders' lives at risk. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you. And uh, I think it's a pretty broad statement that this company is putting Islanders' lives at risk. Mr. Speaker, I agree 100% with the questions that have been brought forward, that uh, the concern that I've heard from all areas of uh, all members in this legislature Yes, there needs to be service improvements. I've referenced the additional 13 paramedics that will be part of uh, Island EMS as we do move forward. Additional vehicles that will be placed on the road as well, Mr. Speaker. These are just a couple of the initiatives that are taking place. And uh, yes, we have to do better. We will do better. Thank you. Mermaid Strafford. Last night I received another shocking email from an island paramedic and for their safety they used a burner account and false name to, to protect and hide their identity. The Premier says all islanders are safe to speak up but those that are working on the front line strongly disagree and are frankly insulted that he would pretend that that's not the case. Question to the Minister of Health. A recent call for a child seizing came in and the closest ambulance was almost 40 minutes away. How many tragedies are you willing to accept before you're willing to do something? Well, Mr. Speaker, I guess I would have to answer that question in two different uh, respects. Uh, with regard to paramedics, uh, I've spoke with them. Ones on this side of, uh, of the house have spoken with them. Any paramedic can reach out to me, have a conversation, put forward their concerns at any point in time in complete confidence. And Mr. Speaker, I assure that to every paramedic that is working right across this province in any area of the health care delivery system. With regard to the second part of uh, the honorable member's uh, question, 
Uh, do I feel that's uh, acceptable? No. And that's why we are looking. We are working actively to make improvements here, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Summerside, Walmart. Mr. Speaker, it's looking more and more like the Residential Tenancy Act isn't coming this sitting. And given how many people in Summerside are being impacted by huge rent increases, that's really worrying to me. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Given how expensive everything is right now, do you really think Islanders can afford to wait for better rental protections? Uh, well, Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the uh, the current Rental of Residential Properties Act is one that has been placed for, for 30 years. And uh, as we know, uh, Prince Edward Island is pretty much the only jurisdiction in Canada province-wise that has rent controls. And th that has uh, has served us well, and it continues to serve us well in, in that way. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, it's no, no uh, secret that the official opposition has been advocating really strongly for tenants, not so much for landlords. They really want tenants to have better protections. And in fact, uh, there are a lot of increased protections for tenants in the Residential Tenancy Act. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have to make sure we ensure the supply of housing and uh, we ensure that uh, landlords can provide those as well. And that's what we're going to do and we're going to continue working until we get the legislation right. Thank you. Summerside, Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, let's unpack how well this actually does serve people. When people go through a hearing for a larger than allowable rent increase, they're often disillusioned by the process. What is being used to make the decision to increase a senior's rent by 30%, 40%, 50% is totally unclear, and the decisions made by the director are done so in secret. Mm -hmm. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Why are the decisions from the rental board kept from the public? Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and this is a really, really important topic. And, and the member from Summerside, Wilma, and I have had many conversations on this. And, and uh, the Islander, uh, uh, the, the Island Regulatory and Appeals Commission, of course, is a quasi-judicial body. And they are the ones currently responsible, uh, the, the director in there, for it. Uh, for enforcing the uh, Rental Residential Properties Act. And Mr. Speaker, this is one of the conversations we're having. It's not finalized. We want to continue to work with the official opposition. We want to work with uh, advocacy groups for, for both landlords and tenants. And we want to get this right because transparency is, is a key issue that we have to get right going forward. Summerside Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, the legislation says landlords are entitled to make a return on their capital investment. But it appears that we're considering the market value mm -hmm. of properties in that calculation. And that's problematic because landlords hire someone <coughs> to do a valuation. They pay that person. So there's a conflict of interest there. But it also means that a capital investment can increase without any meaningful improvements mm -hmm. to the unit for the tenant. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. What is your department doing to address this issue and protect tenants from excessive and unfair rent increases? Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So as a member of Cross uh, knows that uh, that any any uh, rental increase outside of the yearly approved increase uh, by IRAC uh, has to go through a through a process, and um, that it is it does need to be more transparent on, on how they approve those those increases. In fact, I hear from landlord groups as well. They say it's completely inconsistent. They they get different rulings. They may have similar units in the same location, and and, uh, and Mr. Speaker, it's an area we we do have. Uh, some, some work to do in and um, you know we're, we're going to continue to make sure that that process is transparent and we're going to make those improvements. Summerside Wilma. Mr. Speaker, anyone who has gone through that process knows that there are multiple flaws in it. So the minister better not stand in this house and say, we've got a process, we've got a process. This bill has been waiting to be brought to the floor for two years. And in the meantime, you know, because we have had many conversations <laughs> on this, that it is desperately impacting people's lives. Final question to the same minister. While we're waiting for you to get this bill to the House, are you considering any interim protections, like putting a cap on how much that above the allowable increase can be so people are not priced out of their homes? Well, well thank you, Mr. Speaker. So um, I don't have to remind the member of the, the history of this act. It was in for 30 years. We've seen unprecedented market conditions and increases in housing across the province. And uh, the act is, frankly, is not standing up under that sort of pressure. Mr. Speaker, the previous administration chose to outsource the development of a new act to a third party without any consultations. I made sure that we actually brought it over into the Department of Social Development and Housing, got policy experts working on it. We've been doing that for a year, Mr. Speaker. It's been one year. And Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, we're not, we're not where we need to be yet. And we need to do exactly the things you're talking about. In the interim, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, nothing's off the table. And if you have some specific suggestions, I, I would take them. It's something we've discussed in the department. Uh, we don't have anything we're ready to bring forward at this time. Thank you. Time for Alan Sherbrooke. Over the past few weeks, I've highlighted some issues workers have faced in their workplaces on PEI. Since then, I have heard from several workers who were fired from their jobs after filing harassment complaints. There seems to be no consequences for employers who, instead of addressing issues of harassment in the workplace, simply sweep them under the rug by firing the victims and pretending it never happened. Question to the Minister. Has your department ever penalized an employer for terminating an employee after they had brought forward concerns about workplace harassment? Honourable uh, Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Honourable Member, for the question. So this is a concern if that has happened. Uh, it is illegal to do that. Uh, I've said in this House numerous times we will not tolerate that. I would like these people to, uh, in confidence, uh, meet with the department to get the whole story, and we will definitely <laughs> act on it. Thank Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm Valen Sherbro. Mr. Speaker, I've also heard that some workplaces have fired more than one worker on separate occasions for bringing forward issues of harassment. Question to the Minister, does your department track work workplaces wherein multiple harassment claims have been filed? And if so, what additional measures are put in place to protect workers in these workplaces? Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yes, they would uh, track that. Uh, um, I guess the, the so-called, if, if you would say, re repeat offenders. Uh, so uh, businesses that would uh, uh, would have numerous complaints are, are tracked and, and followed up on. Uh, Honourable Member, if, uh, if this has happened, uh, we need to do something about it. So I strongly suggest uh, get these people to reach out to, uh, to uh, my employment standards crew and uh, we will sit down uh, in conference and we will uh, do what they can to, to help these people out because uh, it's illegal and uh, we will not tolerate it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm curious to know how many, uh, you know, of these claims, uh, sorry, how many workplaces are being tracked for multiple claims. Uh, it's very concerning and I was surprised to hear about this too and it's, it's more than we expect, I think. The Occupational Health and Safety Act regulations prevent employers from disclosing information identifying complainants. However, I keep hearing from workers that this happens all the time, impacting their ability to obtain future employment. Last week, I asked the minister about the consequences for an employer who shares confidential information about a worker and how often this is actually enforced on PEI, and he didn't have an answer at that time. Minister, I will ask you again, what consequences have employers faced when sharing confidential information about a worker, and how often is this actually enforced? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Another good question, uh, Honourable Member. I don't have the answer to that, but I assure you I will take everything back uh, tomorrow uh, that you requested uh, to, to get to the bottom of this, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, also, Honourable Member, um, I'll also check, because a lot of these complaints could uh, could be filed under the humans, human rights as well that I might not be privy to, so I'll see what other information I can find out, and I'll do my very best to uh, help these workers that, uh, that were uh, wrongly, wrongfully fired. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Subsidized residents in long-term care receive comfort allowance to buy items not provided by the home. Common expenses include transportation, hairdressing services, toiletries, subscriptions, clothing, and other personal items. The problem is the allowance is only $123 per month and has not been adjusted under this government. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Given the increase in cost of all items and affordability crisis that Islanders are facing today, will you immediately raise the comfort allowance to a reasonable amount to ensure Islanders are able to live with dignity? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and Mr. Speaker, uh, I definitely will go back and I'll verify this information to make, make sure that uh, all the statements are accurate and correct. Because uh, that, that, is, that is concerning to me as well. If it's $123 and it hasn't been changed, uh, we review our rates and we review our numbers. And if this is something we somehow miss, we're definitely going to address it. Thank you. Charlottetown, West Royalty. Well, I, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm concerned because everything has gone up. And I mean, this government's confined free meal vouchers for tourists, but they can't take care of, of people and, and our own islanders that are struggling to live. Um, you, look at, you look at a round trip for Pat and the Elephant, it's $60. Um, for many long-term residents, uh, th 
this, this, they can't cover this. They, it's not in their comfort allowance. You know, like if, if you take two trips, it's $120, they're left with $3 and they can have maybe a half a cup of coffee each way from Tim's. I mean, that's not enough. Um, but I've got an idea for you, Minister. Will you provide these residents with, with vouchers for one free outing per month with Pat and the Elephant to encourage and assist them to be able to socialize and improve their wellness and can continue to live well? Provide them a chit or a voucher. Would you look at that, Minister? Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, that, that, is a, that is a good idea that's being put forward by the member from uh, Charlottetown West Royalty. It's great to talk about solutions. Uh, as you know, uh, this government is looking at and bringing in uh, Tooney Transit. And so this would be a program that could exist a alongside that. Pat and the Elephant, of course, provides a great service um, to, to, our, to islanders. And uh, we, we already support them in, in the department. And so it, it's something I'll ask the department to to take a look into into and uh, I know there are definitely services uh, provided by Pat and the Elephant in some cases for free so I'm sure we can figure something out. Thank you. John Bonnemer from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thanks for that Minister and I'm just going to uh, ask the Minister of Health and Wellness um, another question on long-term care. The garden home um, uh, it's, it's home to 127 wonderful island seniors. They've been operating on a provisional license over the last few months. After prov uh, provincial inspections in October and November of last year revealed they were, they were not meeting the standards. Uh, they were non-compliant in three areas and partially compliant in 26 areas. The, prov the, provin the provincial license is in effect for only one more month or till the end of April. Question to the minister. Are you, what are you doing to ensure the health and safety of these residents considering the results of the fall inspection? And will you see another provisional license issues for the garden home? Double Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the Honourable Member uh, for the question. Uh, with regard to the Garden Home and with regard to uh, provisional licenses, uh, Mr. Speaker, as the Honourable Member knows that there are inspections carried out, that these provisional licenses are then issued by a board, that they are reviewed, that there's conditions that are put in place there with regard to the provisional license, and that uh, with regard to a reinstatement. Of, uh, of a full license, the conditions do have to be met. Uh, each case, Mr. Speaker, is looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, and uh, I do. I have uh, complete confidence that the appropriate processes are in place and will continue to be adhered to, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Honourable Member from Tignesh Pomeroy, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our caucus continues to advocate in this House for Islanders who many in this House have forgotten about who we refer to as the working poor. They get up every work day and they pay their taxes. The government seems to think about these individu individuals only when it comes time to use their hard-earned dollars to pay for programs that they do not qualify for. We've seen it in, the, in, the, in their $20 million affordability announcement, and we've seen it once again with their new carbon plan and the $140 rebate they won't qualify for. Question to the Deputy, Minister, uh, Deputy Premier. How much more are you going to take from our middle class without giving them anything in return? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. I'm glad you asked that question because that is something that I bring up all the time in both with, with my colleagues about what we can do for the working poor, we can call it, I guess, or people that get up every day and do go to work and want to pay their bills and want to do what they need to do for their family. And Honourable Member, we'll continue to work through all departments to try and find a way. I know one thing we're doing right now is looking at affordable housing projects that are not for social assistance clients, but for people that are having a hard time, young families that can't, you know, find a down payment or can't afford to get into a house. So, I remember it's something that is top of mind for, for myself and for all, all my colleagues. Thank you, Speaker. Honourable Member from Kingdish Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, those with household incomes of fifty to seventy thousand dollars, they're not rich. They include single parents that are nurses, they're, they're teachers. They're trying to make ends meet, and even with two incomes. They have difficulty just trying to raise their children, save for the future. They just can't seem to get ahead. Programs like the new dental care program, the home renovation program, and the not-so-free heat pump program are just a few examples of the programs that exclude individuals who fall within our working poor. Those living paycheck to paycheck while raising a family, paying off student debt, a car loan, supporting aging parents, or putting $500 a month in a tank of gas just to drive in rural PEI Question. to their workplace. Question to the deputy. Uh, 
Premier, you, you said you continue to work, but will you commit? Will you commit to making these programs more inclusive to islanders that are stuck in the middle? Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. I will commit to that. It's something that I believe in. I believe that we should be helping those who need help the most and those who are working, going out every day, trying to raise a family and really do need the help that, that we can provide. But it is a challenge and I would look to the Honourable Members across the floor to give us any idea that you have on ways that we can uh, improve that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Dignish Pomero, Deputy Speaker, second supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, this question is to the Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Um, are you aware of the DFO's announcement this afternoon on a moratorium on spring herring and mackerel? And, because that's going to have a huge impact on our lobster fishers and PI who use that for fresh bait, four weeks away from setting day, huge impact on our island fishers. Minister, what are you going to do about it? Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's a great question. I was made aware of this morning that the uh, DFO was a uh, imposing a moratorium on the spring uh, herring and mackerel. That fishery to PEI is roughly worth around 1,900 metric tons, or about $1.9 million to the industry. However, I can tell you that I've had conversations in the last uh, probably a couple of months with DFO on our, on our, on our stocks. Uh, mackerel and herring are of a critical level and we must make sure our fishery is sustainable for the future. I can tell the honourable member that we've had conversations with, uh, I have with other industry and other go uh, governments such as Norway last week regarding, uh, you know, substitute baits that could help our fishers and what could be available to them. Um, but we also have some innovative people out there that are uh, producing new alternative baits such as bait masters uh, down in the honourable member, uh, the Cornwall area. Uh, so we will have these discussions and we will make sure that our fishers uh, have the best possible access to bait that is uh, available to them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, accurate revenue estimates affect all residents of this province through the levels of taxation, government spending, services provided, and the provincial economy. Accuracy is crucial. The most recent Auditor General's report indicated that, and I quote, the province's budget presentation is not comparable to the consolidated financial statements. Question to the Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier. Do you believe that the condition of the province's finances and an accurate representation of anticipated revenues is very important? Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'll remember, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you that it's very important. Sometimes a challenge to, to create the most accurate revenues because we deal with the federal government and a number of variables, but yes, I absolutely agree. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The long-anticipated carbon levy plan that you tabled last week, and may I add at the 11th hour, indicates an increase of 67 percent for carbon levy fees on gasoline and diesel that islanders will be paying at the pumps in the form of a 4.42 cent per litre increase for gasoline and 5.36 cents per litre on diesel. Question to the Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier. Can you explain why the budget that you have presented indicates an increase of only 9 per cent in carbon levy revenues for the upcoming year when your levy is increasing by 67 per cent? Wow. The Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Yeah, that was a long way from the budget will balance itself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. I will be tabling a document here during table of documents, and I will have an explanation for some of that. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party, or Second Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If a revenue stream is increasing substantially, say by 67 percent, one would expect that revenues would be also be protected to increase substantially. Unless you are anticipating a massive decrease in total liters sold or introducing new accept, exemptions that remain <coughs> hidden. Minister, did you, did you forget that you were planning on increasing this levy on the backs of Islanders when you wrote the budget, or are you trying to convince everyone that 67 percent equals nine? Oh. Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and Honorable Member. We are increasing this levy because of the federal government. We, oh. we are oh. obligated, oh. obligated. Oh. obligated to obligate it to ensure that we meet with the parameters that the federal government have put in place. We are a leader in, in green technology and green in carbon admission, uh, reduction, and we will continue to do that regardless of what the opposition has to say. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Monique Kilmuir. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. One of the calls I get consistently in emails in my district is the lack of childcare spaces. 
A question to the Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning. How long should a family expect to wait for childcare in the Three Rivers area? The Honourable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable yeah. Member, for the question. Uh, this is a, an incredibly um, good question. It's excellent to see you. Um, advocating on behalf of your area as it relates to child care. So as everybody knows, recently we signed the, uh, an agreement with the federal government and this year we'll be expecting $27 million um, to support our child care system. This is a five-year agreement with a two-year action plan and within that two-year action plan, Mr. Speaker, we've committed to uh, creating 452 new spaces. Uh, just this uh, past March, uh, on March 1st, in fact, we um, announced that we were creating 220 additional spaces within our designated centers and 25 of those I believe were in the three uh, rivers area um, so certainly mr. speaker it's a priority for us to increase access to spaces by working with um, community uh, municipalities as well as our centers across the island thank you very much mr. speaker Kilmer uh, thank you mr. speaker and I still have families reaching out to me that can't access child care. Um, they're on the they're in the, they're on the registry, but some cases over a year, two year wait, um, and they can't. One one person asked me the other day, how can I return to the workforce if I can't access childcare? And this disproportionately affects women, of course. Question to the Minister of Education: What should families do who cannot access childcare right now? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you, Honourable Member, for, for the question. Um, COVID has certainly shone light, a light on the importance of childcare uh, more than ever before, and it's di and the disproportionate impact on, on women specifically. Mr. Speaker, I can assure this House uh, that I am working on this file. It's of uh, utmost priority to me, and I know the team uh, within it, Sonia Hooper, Carolyn Simpson, Doreen Gillis, and all the team. This is, honestly, if you could see the amount of progress we made just in this past year since si signing the agreement. It's absolutely tremendous. Although I, I may not be able to provide a, a short-term solution to those families, I do encourage families to, to get onto the registry um, as soon as they possibly can. Mr. Speaker, and we are hearing a lot of success stories across the board, and we'll continue working on this and, and increasing access to, to child care across the island. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Malakul Kilmyar, your second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and I, I completely realize that um, you know, we can't create new spaces just tomorrow. We can't wave a magic wand. We can't just press a button and it's done. But there are families that need childcare right now. They, in three months' time, they have to return to work and they don't have childcare and they cannot find anywheres to send their child. A question to the Minister of Education. What can we do to ensure that families in Three Rivers have access to <coughs> childcare, not in two years' time, but over the next three to four months? The Honorable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, last week I rose and spoke about our family home centers and how many unlicensed um, home centers there are out there. And uh, we've done some information centers around, uh, or information sessions around the incentives that we're providing to home centers to, to become licensed. And with that, they are increasing their spaces, Mr. Speaker. So I think um, as the MLA for the area, I think um, you can get out and, and um, make it known in the community that those incentives are available for those home centers. Um, Mr. Speaker, I also would encourage you to reach out to the department. Um, certainly we have uh, individuals within the department who are working across uh, the island um, to, to try to fit some of those gaps, fill some of those gaps, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I think together we'll be able to um, help support those families in your community. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Somerside South Drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. PEI is a leader in clean tech here in Canada, but uh, amongst PEI, Summerside's a leader in the world when it comes to clean tech. Wind, solar, batteries, artificial intelligence, distributed storage through its uh, Heat for Less program, EV chargers all over the place, a microgrid coming at Slemon Park, and a partnership with Samsung to make Summerside the smartest city in North America. It also has a new business park that's been coined as an eco park with an intent on attracting new clean tech businesses to PEI. A question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. What was it that made Georgetown the best place for a new multi-million dollar clean tech oh, park? Oh, 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 oh. Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't know why all the chuckles about Georgetown. We are the capital of Kings County. We've been underserved by governments for the last 50 years. We have governments try to close our schools down. We have governments that refuse to pave the road into Georgetown and widen so it had shoulders. Now, can you imagine there wasn't shoulders onto the capital of Kings County until I came along, and you guys are against pavement. So I'll tell you why it's Georgetown. It's the capital of Kings County. It has a resilient community who fights for what they believe in, who fights for their community, who fought against the government to keep their school, who fights every day to keep their rink open, who fights every day to keep the playhouse open, who fights every day to keep their fire trucks on the road. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud that it's going to be in Georgetown because the people of Georgetown deserve to be treated well by their government. Hey, Summerside says drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, I didn't hear any actual reason there, just that, the, you know, the minister really likes Georgetown. And, and you know, I'll, I'll remind the minister that the capital of Prince County is actually Princetown, which is now Malpec. So maybe you could look at putting some infrastructure at Malpec, too, there, minister. <laughs> Summerside is going forward with its clean tech initiatives with or without the support of this minister. But I have to wonder if the minister's willing to offer help. I know there's a big Sunbank project going forward in Summerside, but I also know that was developed long before this minister was installed. A question to the minister. Will you commit to ensuring one of the new tax-free zones will be available to Summerside? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. <clears throat> so, uh, the Honourable Member probably doesn't know that I met with Summerside recently and had these very discussions. Obviously you don't because you're, you're asking uh, for solutions to problems that are already solved, but I met with the City of Summerside <laughs> here recently, really happy about the projects that they're doing, really happy about the relationships they have. We're planning on uh, expanding some of the relationships that they have opened the doors with Samsung to help the rest of Prince Edward Island take advantage of the great work that Summerside has done. Uh, I spoke to uh, the Atlantica group here recently and I praised the work of Summerside as being a leader and I said we are modeling Prince Edward Island after Summerside. So I am more than proud to, to, to associate with Summerside, I'm more than proud to, to work with them on their eco park and I'm more than proud to put money in the community there to help them get the work done that they need done. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Belvedere, final question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The IPCC rele released its latest climate report last month, um, Impact Adaptation and Vulnerability. Mr. Speaker, we have in this budget a COVID contingency fund and a potato wart contingency fund because we recognize that these are real emergencies and we need to plan for the unexpected. Question for the Minister of Finance and the Deputy Premier. Why don't we have a climate contingency fund? Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Um, I, the, so this is something that my department is working on. I know I tabled the report here last year that shows what uh, Prince Edward Island is really in for. So we've had conversations with uh, with Wilkinson, the Minister of Energy, and we've had uh, we've had uh, conversations with the Minister of Environment in Ottawa. We've talked about what we're trying going to try to accomplish here. We've asked for their help to help us make the adaptations we need. We're making an adaptation plan now. We hope to have it out. We, we're hoping to have it out at least by the fall because that's when the federal government wants to have all the provinces have a plan to feed into their plan. They plan to fund it. So by the looks of it, this year there, there may be limited funds from Ottawa. Uh, we are looking at some capital projects that we hope to put in the capital budget as demonstration projects for uh, some of the things that we, we need to do, but we're currently going through the stages with all the different groups here in Prince Edward Island to talk about what adaptations would be needed to account for climate change. So you're, you're right, it's, the report was damning. We have a lot of work to do. We have to start hustling but we don't want to be accused of not having a proper plan. So we're, we're planning this properly. We're going as fast as we can, but we will tackle this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable members, just before we uh, move on in question period, when questions are asked with supplementary questions, in Rule 63, I do believe in the rule book, that supplementary questions may be asked about the same topic, same subject. Just beware of uh, supplementary questions that they should be, the, the, the sub-questions should be uh, related to the subject. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Honourable members, are you questioning the speaker? Thank you.
<laughs> Statements by ministers. Donna Brown, Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise to today to announce that through the 2021-2022 Community Housing Fund, government will provide nearly $700,000 in housing projects led by community organizations. Valley Cooperative, Community Inclusions, Lennon House, and I should mention that we have Ronnie Nicholson, who's the President of the Board of Directors of Lennon Recovery House here in the gallery today, uh, Royal Canadian Legion, Stars for Life, and Six for Stones Development are among this year's recipients. Cooperative Housing, and we had a great meeting with the, uh, the member from Charlottetown Brighton the other day on this subject, uh, residential housing for Islanders with disabilities, transitional housing for Islanders in recovery, and affordable housing options for veterans and their families are all being funded through the 21-22 Community Housing Fund. Uh, notably, uh, Lennon House will receive $50,000 to research the development of transitional housing for Islanders recovering from addictions. They have some excellent ideas on that front. Uh, the Royal Canadian Legion will receive $50,000 for design and planning of affordable housing projects for veterans and their families. Stars for Life, Mr. Speaker, will receive $200,000 to purchase a supportive housing facility in the Greater Charlottetown area for individuals on the autism spectrum disorder, or with autism spectrum disorder, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, this funding will also support the creation of a guide on how to create and register cooperative housing projects. And Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that the government is investing yet another $3 million in the Community Housing Fund. And this is a partnership, of course, with the Canadian Mental Health Association to provide a third round of funding. And with this new round of funding, Mr. Speaker, $500,000 has been earmarked specifically for Indigenous housing projects. Now, Indigenous organizations must have the opportunity to lead the way in creating housing options that work best for Indigenous communities. And earmarking these funds is one way that we can foster those opportunities. Nonprofits, community-based service organizations, municipalities and developers all can apply, Mr. Speaker, for support to help create more affordable housing options for Islanders in need. So, Mr. Speaker, this fund will be open as of April 15th and we'll move to a continuous intake model. So all members in this House, please, again, all those organizations can apply. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to take a moment to recognize staff within Housing Services, CMHA, PEI, and fund recipients for their ongoing work in creating more affordable housing options for Islanders on an ongoing basis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I always think that it's it's a good announcement when we give money to community organizations to, to do what they know best. Um, in a case like housing, um, what we need is, is actual housing. And so <laughs> giving people money to do research is fantastic. I, I would dare say that most of them already have all of that information needed and so would question why we don't just start building the housing. It's not a matter of if we need it, it's a matter of we need it now. That's right. And I would like to see this government continue supporting community organizations to do what they knew know to do what they do best, but to also actually build something. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable member from Charlottetown, West Royalty, and the third party House Leader. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to uh, congratulate the Minister on this announcement. I mean, we're talking about some important dollars going into housing, and I mean, this, this fund, the first part was done last year, I remember this announcement, we talked about this is an extension or moving on, but is, is, it, is it enough, or do we have, we, we have a housing problem across the board, and people can't get housing, so these are an amazing projects, but we have to do more, and you have to do more. And again, you have to build more housing, and you, you don't have much time to do that. But I want to congratulate the recipients of this, especially um, Stars for Life, which is in my district. That $200,000 is very important, and I have some ideas for that. Um, I'd like to talk to the the, uh, the minister about later on because they do need more space, and any any housing into autism. Uh, to support Stars for Life in the autism program is fantastic. Congratulations to Lennon House, um, as well as the Indigenous housing uh, announcement is very, very crucial and very, very important, and I'd like to applaud
applaud the minister for that. Um, but in, uh, all in all, this minister just had a good announcement. Thank you very much. End of statements by ministers. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table realign of 2021-22 revenue forecast and prior year amounts. And I move seconded by the member from Raldona that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Did I miss anyone? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to give a bit of an explanation for the tabling that I just did. Oh, sure. Okay, thank you. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to table a minor administrative correction to the budget estimates document, specifically related to page 15, revenue from provincial loan sources. Staff in my department have confirmed that a few values for revenues for the current fiscal year 21-22 on page 15 were misallocated and presented on the wrong lines. This was due to an administrative issue with a spreadsheet that was not linked to the proper columns when they were resorted before printing. The total tax revenue line is correct, as the correct numbers are in the column. They are just misaligned. While the total for taxes, as well as licenses and permits, are correct, the forecast values for gasoline tax, health taxes on liquor and tobacco, along with the carbon levy, are not listed on the proper lines in the taxes section. And similarly, the values reported for building permits, applications, Insurance Act, Water Testing and uh, Companies Act were also transposed. I'm tabling today a document that aligns the forecast and prior year revenue amounts with the values determined by departments and represents the proper presentation. This is a significant, this is significant work done to, to validate all the expenditures and revenue budget numbers presented in the budget book. However, in light of this, I've asked staff to review the entirety of the budget book to ensure accuracy, which they have done. I want to make sure that the public and the members of this House are aware of this formatting issue in the budget document and of the update required to page 15, revenue from provincial loan sources. The online copy of the budget book will be updated by end of business day if it hasn't been already. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. Mr. Speaker, by command of Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg leave to table the Autism Coordination Act annual report for the period ending 2021, and I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Did I miss anyone? Reports by committees. The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Standing Committee on Rules, Regulations, Private Bills and Privileges, I beg leave to introduce the second report of the second session of the said committee, entitled Private Bill Number 200. I move seconded by the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, that the report be now received and do lie on the table. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Rule 110.5 of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly, I will move the motion for adopting the report tomorrow. Mar um, Thursday, March 31st. Shall I carry? Carry. Any more reports by committees? <coughs> Introduction of government bills, motions other than government, orders of the, the honorable member for Mermaid Stratford and the opposition house leader. Mr. Speaker, I call motion 107. Shall I carry? Carry. <coughs> Speaker, motion 107, calling on government to improve and move towards public paramedicine, is under debate. Debate was adjourned by the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness to start debate. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, it certainly is a pleasure uh, again to be able to rise and speak to this motion, uh, Mr. Speaker. As I had wrapped up my comments yesterday and uh, even prior to that, Mr. Speaker, I had indicated that, yes, on the province of PEI, we have, without a doubt, the best paramedics. I've seen it firsthand, and I referenced that yesterday, uh, Mr. Speaker, in my comments. Uh, the, the quality of service, the compassion 
that are showing, is showing, to Islanders by our paramedics when they, uh, when they respond. Uh, Mr. Speaker, you look at, uh, at the motion before us and uh, a couple of the portions of, uh, of the resolution are therefore be it resolved. And Mr. Speaker, I agree 100% that people in any occupation, but certainly what we're talking about here is with regard to paramedics, that paramedics have a right to expect comparable conditions and benefits as their colleagues in other provinces. Now, having said that, Mr. Speaker, everybody in this legislature realizes that PEI paramedics, they do operate in a unionized environment with a collective agreement. They negotiate that collective agreement, Mr. Speaker. And as they enter a new bargaining period, I am sure that the strong voices from our paramedics that are involved in those negotiations will come forward, will be heard loud and clear, Mr. Speaker. And that their interest is there, I know it's there, in bringing their salaries in line with the regional peers. Mr. Speaker, we have seen cost of living increases recently. And again, I am confident that the union will advocate will negotiate for comparable pay uh, rates. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, and as I'd mentioned before, uh, they are collective agreements. There's a negotiation process there. Members vote. It's part of the democratic process, Mr. Speaker. So when I read, therefore be it resolved, that the Legislative Assembly urged government to immediately increase paramedic salaries. Mr. Speaker, I, I can appreciate exactly where the mover and the seconder are coming from in this, and I don't disagree with them. Where I do have the concern, Mr. Speaker, <coughs> is that it's being asked here of government to intervene in collective bargaining. And I personally, uh, as an Islander, as an elected official, and as a Minister of Health and Wellness, I have a concern with that, Mr. Speaker, and I want that on the record. Mr. Speaker, our government and the service provider are working to make sure that we have the needed personnel to staff our paramedic services. Holland College is training paramedics every year and our system is prepared to take on paramedics to add to the strength of our system. And Mr. Speaker, over the last few days here, I have referenced different times uh, the uh, new graduates that are going to be coming out from Holland College, that the reach out to these new graduates, and that there are 11 of them that have agreed that are going to be working with Island EMS. I referenced as well, Mr. Speaker, two <coughs> paramedics that have moved to the province from other jurisdictions that are being interviewed, and I am optimistic that they will become employees of Island EMS as well. When I ended my comments uh, in speaking uh, to this motion uh, yesterday, Mr. Speaker, I would referenced two the challenges that those in our more rural areas may have with regard, they may have a real interest, and I know that there's a number of ones that do have a real interest, a real passion in becoming paramedics. But one of the challenges is, if they're in Tignish, or they're in O'Leary, or they're in Alberton, or they're in Surrey, is the fact that the only place that the course is offered here on the island is here in Charlottetown, and that's great not to take away from it being offered here. But I am having the discussions and will continue to have discussions of where else that that can be offered. Because I do understand that one of the, the challenges uh, in our, in staffing, and especially in staffing in our rural areas, Mr. Speaker, is just that we do not have the paramedics from those rural areas. 
And we have to look at ways that we can provide that training. And again, whether it's in Western PEI or whether it's in uh, Eastern Kings, Mr. Speaker. I referenced yesterday about the Human Services Program that was brought in in the fall after the 2019 election. And I was told initially, again, as I mentioned yesterday, no, we'll never get bottoms in the seats. There's not enough ones interested. So yes, there was the first, second, third, and looking forward to the fourth intake. So don't tell me that there's not interest in our rural communities for these occupations and for these professions, Mr. Speaker. And I do, uh, I do agree, uh, Mr. Speaker, that, but we do need to make changes to ensure that our frontline paramedic staff are supported, as I'd referenced, certainly under collective agreements and negotiation process. That is uh, part and parcel of it. Uh, and I've heard, as members right on every side of this House, whether it's the third party official opposition or here in the government side, Mr. Speaker, have heard from paramedics. And as I had uh, indicated uh, uh, earlier today, that when I hear that, uh, that individuals, that professionals in any occupation, any profession, feel that, uh, that they're muted, that they can't speak out, so on, again, I put that out there. I give the assurances to any paramedic who wants to reach out to me, and they don't have to share a name if they don't want to, but I am more than happy to speak with them. As I've indicated uh, to uh, my caucus colleague, a uh, member from Morel Dona, uh, the ones that have reached out to him, I've indicated to him, I'm more than happy to sit down with him and the paramedic, or if that paramedic so likes to just sit down with that individual, to hear their side, to hear their concerns. But to me, even more importantly, is to follow up on those concerns and hear they're on the ground, they're the ones that are living it, that are working it day in, day out, to hear their suggestions and uh, what, what they feel as well. The challenges there. We know some of them. We've heard about some of them, Mr. Speaker. But I think too that we also have to look at uh, at the modernization of paramedic services. And Mr. Speaker, that includes such things as community paramedicine programs. It's going to provide for such things as a mobile mental health response service and mobile integrated health response, Mr. Speaker, that we need to improve access to care for patients right across the board, but for patients who might otherwise have to call 911 or visit an emergency department. And Mr. Speaker, we are seeing great interest in these programs. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, when I had referenced the mobile mental health response service, the feedback that I, as Minister, have heard from Islanders on that service has been extremely positive. And uh, I know it is difficult uh, to say the impact that it has or has not had with regard to ER department uh, visits, but those are the types of initiatives that we have to look forward to, that we have to look at. Uh, I'd mentioned earlier today, Mr. Speaker, with regard to medical homes, medical neighborhoods. Uh, I think uh, you look at uh, the website of uh, MCPEI, uh, but, uh, and some of the comments that are made there by our new physicians, how pleased they are to be here in the province. I've heard from nurses as well not saying that we don't have challenges, without a doubt we do, but we have to make our paramedics, our professionals in the paramedicine field, feel that same way that some of the individuals that I have referenced here, some of the professionals, some of the doctors uh, that I uh, have referenced, and again, uh, uh, I would certainly encourage all members to take a look at the Medical Society of PEI their website 
and see what some of the new physicians that have recently moved to PEI, how they feel about practicing here. And Mr. Speaker, we will continue to be innovative and we will continue to improve our service. Mr. Speaker, we have to support paramedics, we have to respond to their needs, and we have to support paramedics for a number of reasons. But to me, Mr. Speaker, the main reason, the primary reason, is because they do so much for us. And there's so many of us here in the walls, within the walls of this legislature that have seen it firsthand when either as uh, personally as I had uh, talked about yesterday, or loved ones required the services of an ambulance. And again, the compassion, the care, the professionalism that has been shown there. Mr. Speaker, the number of 911 calls requiring an ambulance response has risen. It's risen drastically. Since back in 2007, 6,000 calls to over 22,000 last year. Mr. Speaker, uh, there's other factors involved there. Certainly we've come through a pandemic. There's a, a variety of reasons that, uh, that Islanders will reach out to call 911. But Mr. Speaker, the top five most common ambulance call types in 2020, 21, were first of all, general malaise, secondly, falls, third, breathing problems, fourth, chest pain, and fifth one, Mr. Speaker, unconscious and fainting. And Mr. Speaker, many of these calls are for conditions that are not necessarily life-threatening. And that's why we do have the professionals that do the triage to determine what is the level of acuity with regard to these calls. But Mr. Speaker, each call has to uh, be handled with uh, compassion, with dignity. But Mr. Speaker, I do, again, I want to say that the quality of our paramedic work is second to none. And Mr. Speaker, I know that there's others here that, uh, that do want to speak uh, to this motion. Uh, I could certainly go on for a substantial length of time in speaking uh, to it. Uh, but as I've said before, you know, I had spoke about the, the first, therefore be it resolved. Secondly, therefore be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to prepare a strategic plan to transition paramedicine services to the public health care system. I just want to speak about that very briefly, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as, as I've referenced here uh, yesterday when I was talking, speaking to this motion and again here today, we certainly, we do have to look at ways that we can do things differently, how we can improve services. And we've seen that, uh, the gov our government's commitment across the board. And I will agree with uh, members from the opposition that these initiatives sometimes, even from my perspective, where I sit at as the Minister of Health and Wellness, take longer to roll out than I had originally anticipated or that I would have hoped uh, uh, the timeline to be. But Mr. Speaker, I think you look at some of these, like the rollout of the electronic medical records which is such an important component of our medical homes as we move that uh, concept and put those first ones in place, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you look at uh, uh, the provincial dental care program. You look at the shingles vaccine. Again, some of these things took longer than, than any of us would have hoped for, but they are out there now. Mr. Speaker, you look at the drug funding formula. The addition of Himlibra, the addition of Tracafta, and I know that ones here in this legislature, myself included, have seen what a tremendous difference that the addition of some of those medications have made. So we always have to be looking, Mr. Speaker, right across the board with regard to the delivery of the ver variety of health services that as a province we do deliver in partnership uh, with uh, whether it may be our pharmacies, uh, 
uh, you know, and other partners within the healthcare system. But to be always striving to make improvements, to make improvements that are going to result in better health care for Islanders and better results for Islanders. So, Mr. Speaker, I agree completely with the premise of what is being put forward here. But where I do have the concern is where it's stated definitely to transition paramedicine services to the public health care system. Again, Mr. Speaker, I think we always have to be looking at ways that we can improve different options, different alternatives. And I am very, I'm more than willing and open to do that. But to just tunnel vision me in on this, that it's going to be the public health care system, strategic plan, uh, I, I do. I, I have to be completely upfront here, Mr. Speaker. I do have a concern with that. And I think it's only fair for me to share that concern here to the members of the legislature, that it's on the record of that concern. And, uh, to certainly uh, the mover and the seconder of this motion. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I know I've spoken for uh, uh, an extended time period between yesterday and here this afternoon. Uh, again, thank uh, the mover and seconder for bringing this forward, and I do appreciate the opportunity to speak to the motion. Thank you. The Honorable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, the mover and the seconder for bringing the motion forward. Um, you know, one thing I've had a lot of experience with ambulance attendants and and the drivers back since back in 1984, I guess, when I first started dealing with emergency services in New Brunswick and then transition over to Nova Scotia, then here in PEI. But I think, as you can realize, Mr. Speaker, and also the Sergeant of Arms, um, how much how, how much actually these 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 men and women do when they're out there operating these ambulances and the responsibility that they have um, on, on their shoulders and what they actually bring to the table. Um, you know, as we go through time, um, different services, they, they've changed. I can remember, you know, back years ago when, when, you, when, you, when you called an ambulance, you saw the ambulance. You didn't see a police car there with them or you didn't see a fire truck with them. Or you might not see other support staff there with them. Um, I remember that back in New Brunswick. I remember in Nova Scotia in the, in the mid-80s when I worked over there um, in Halifax County that um, you started to see, um, the only time you ever saw a, really a police car with an ambulance was when there was a traffic accident when involved. And then there was times when, you know, if, or you would see a fire truck at a scene, but you'd see an ambulance there. And in some cases, um, <coughs> We, we see these evolve that, that our staff members are there to help each other and our emergency services support each other. And I can always remember back to a lot of different times when, um, when I came to PEI, it was, a, it, was a, it was a complete different shift from a New Brunswick model or to a Nova Scotia model. It was where police departments and fire departments and emergency workers being ambulance attendants, uh, paramedics, they work more um, together. Um, it didn't matter what the call was or what the scene was, it was pretty safe that you were going to have an ambulance guy there uh, or, a, or a young lady paramedic um, or a firefighter uh, or a department of transportation worker there multitasking and multi-helping the different agencies to deal with a situation or an incident. And I think we need, to, we need to recognize that. You know, we're talking about a problem or a situation within the health care and how multiple governments have tried to make the service better for um, islanders and the general public. And at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to accomplish. Doesn't matter who's in power, what government is the administration of the day, um, or what service you're talking about. We're trying, as a government or as a society, a group collectively, to ensure that islanders have the best service possible to available when they pick up the phone and they need the help and we make sure that you know them services are available but I think we also remember that 
over the last two years, two and a half years, uh, we have gone through very different times. You know, we have a health care system that not only dealing with the medical, um, you know, the medical type calls that they normally deal with in the different parts of the hospital uh, or our pharmacies or our health care clinics or our walk-in clinics, but we're also dealing with a pandemic. And it's really taxed our system to its limits. And it showed us how um, valuable that our health care system is to Islanders and how much we need to depend on it and how much we need to make sure that the supports are in place, not only for Islanders, but also for our health care professionals. And uh, my wife, uh, Debbie, she's a nurse, and, and uh, um, her and I have quite heated discussions sometime about the health care system. And I'm very fortunate. Um, um, I, 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 I don't get sick. Um, I, have a very gr I have a very great immune system, and um, I can weather a storm pretty well. But there is other people out there that have, um, you know, a depleted immune system, or they have medical conditions that depend on our health care system on a day-to-day -day basis. And we, we throw into that a <coughs> pandemic and trying to help our health care system going forward. And, you know... I cannot say enough about our professionals, whether it be paramedics or nurses and doctors, the support staff, the janitors that are in the healthcare system that are keeping the place clean. Um, you know, the, the, all them different supports that are there in our healthcare system. And it's all part of what we're talking about when it comes to, um, when it comes to the whole making sure that the proper care is there for our healthcare professionals as they go forward. And we never lose sight of what these people do for us. And it takes a special person to step forward and, you know, put on that uniform and go work at, a, at, a, at an ambulance facility or a, at a police station or at a, at a hospital or at a fire station. These are special people. And I think we all agree that I don't think there's one person in this house or one person in this island that would not say that they are there supporting health care workers and everything that they do on a day-to-day -day <coughs> basis. But Mr. Speaker, how do we... I think the big step is, is as a government and as, a, as an opposition, we're recognizing that we need to be there to support our healthcare professionals and our paramedics and our first responders, our police officers, the people that are behind the scenes making sure that we provide the best level of care we can for Islanders. We all recognize that. So we need to collectively work with our, these organizations and our contractors that actually provide the service and health PEI and anybody that we can that can add a level of, of I want to say support or knowledge to help make the system better because that's what we're trying to do at the end of the day. We're trying to make the system be there when society or islanders need it no matter what time of day, no matter where it is on, this, on, the, on the island and in what situation. <coughs> I will admit and I acknowledge that there's going to be times and places when people are not going to be able to get the service. It's a fact of life. You can't, it, it, it's terrible, but there's times when I can remember having three calls backed up that I was trying to respond to and just not being able to get there in a time or at a time as appropriately needed but we have supports behind us. I knew that I had a hard time understanding or realizing over most of my career I've worked, I worked in a single man police car. Didn't matter if it's in New Brunswick or Nova Scotia and here in, 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 in PEI. And I had a really hard time transitioning when I worked 
in Charlottetown after I retired, and I come back work in Charlottetown some, and I had a real hard time realizing that it was all I had to do was pick up the radio and call from help from another car. And I used to laugh. They used to, they used to tease and say, Jamie, you can always ask for help. And I think that we must make sure that our, our, our frontline staff know that they can ask for help. And they are asking for help. And I think everybody here is listening to that. We know they need help. They know, we know they need supports. But I've explained to people, you just can't go out and pull a paramedic off a tree or a doctor or a nurse and put them into the system. There is a lot of demand and request by other governments and other provinces and other states for these individuals. We must be aware of that. So we must make sure that we can support them to the most as possible and make sure that we treat them as best as we can so that they will call PEI a home and work here in this province. And I have faith in the Minister of Health that he's working on that. You know, we have a staff that are, 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 that, are try, uh, that are recruiting and working on recruitment and improving systems and services as they can with what's allowed to them or what, or what you know, they're trying to grab um, what they can to bring them to PEI. But I think that, Mr. Speaker, when you, when, you talk about, when you talk about these first responders and these paramedics, um, we always can be open to looking at new models. We always can be open to looking at ideas that are brought forth to us by different people and try them and see if they will work here in PEI. And I'm very confident, very confident that the Department of Health under this minister's guidance and this minister's leadership is working towards that. Are we going to solve the problem overnight? No, we're not. But we can make changes and improve the system as we learn new models and, and bring forth new ideas to make the system better for not only the paramedics, but also for islanders and also for our doctors and our nurses and all our health care system. With that, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, will, I, will, I will conclude my remarks saying that, that I have the utmost respect for what our health care professionals and our ambulance and our paramedic operators and drivers do. I'll just tell you one quick story I just, just remembered about it. I remember back in the days when the driver was just the driver. There was only a driver in an ambulance and a paramedic or a highly trained first aid person. And in some cases, the driver would take a nurse to Halifax. I can remember that. My wife used to do that. Debbie used to get a call, would you go with a patient with a driver to Halifax? But we've, 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 taken, we've changed the whole system and improved on it. And I think we can continue to improve on it. And I think I will conclude in saying that we need to be open to change. We need to be open to new ideas, which we recognize. The minister recognizes that. And we need to look at other jurisdictions to find out what they are doing and to see if those ideas and changes can be brought into PEI for the better of all islanders and for the better of our staff that operate our ambulances and work in our hospitals and within our health care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Town Valley, Sherbrooke, and the Opposition Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm so proud to rise in support of this motion. Um, a few things. So uh, uh, the Minister of Health in his statements mentioned uh, some of the things that he has been hearing and, and seeing on. I didn't say where, I didn't catch where he saw this, if it was on social media or, 
or our website or something, but where doctors and nurses are talking about their positive experiences with health PEI. Uh, I think he might also want to check the uh, PEI Nurses Union uh, social media accounts because there are certainly very serious concerns that are being expressed uh, around areas of violence in the workplace, uh, workers feeling silenced, uh, not having enough workers uh, uh, on staff at a time. So there's all kinds of things. So I just I want to start there. But I do want to recognize that uh, the healthcare professionals that the minister mentioned, so doctors, nurses, uh, there's one big difference between them and the paramedics. And that is that their unions negotiate directly with government. There's no middleman. So that's, that's really what we're talking about with this motion here. Um, the fact that Medivy is, is, a, is, a, is a middleman, it's a complication in uh, that relationship between health PEI and the paramedics. So, you know, those paramedics don't have a direct voice to, uh, to really address or bring forward their concerns to health PEI. They have to bring them to their employer, which is Medivy. Uh, that's who they negotiate with. Uh, you know, on the flip side of that, Medivy negotiates with government. So there's, there's all these different layers that, that uh, you have to go through. And it, it's really one of the most clear examples that we have here on PEI as to why privatization of healthcare does not work. It is not okay. You lose control of the quality of the service that we are providing when you privatize healthcare. And uh, I can't see a more clear example than that. Uh, we have the minister saying, you know, that the unions, the, the paramedics union, it's, well, he trusts that they will negotiate for better wages, that it's the union's responsibility to do that. I mean, that just completely is a disconnect from the reality that if we do not um, have the best working conditions possible for paramedics, if they are not being paid at a rate that is at least, at least equal to our neighboring provinces, that we will not be able to recruit and retain enough paramedics uh, to, to address the issues, the significant shortages. It is unbelievable, absolutely horrifying, to be honest, to hear that there's no, there are times when there are no ambulances available to respond to emergency calls anywhere on the island, or one available, um, you know, somewhere on the island that's expected to go wherever is needed. I mean, that is just, I mean, for anyone, and I think, you know, most of us have been in a situation at some point, either yourselves or a loved one, where you've needed to call an ambulance. And it's a scary time, and it's it's a time when, you know, you the idea that you would have to wait half an hour, an hour, two hours more for for that help to come is is unthinkable, and it's 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 unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. Um, Collective agreements are, are, are the minimum standard. We have to also recognize that. So that negotiation between uh, Medivy and the paramedics union, that they are negotiating for you know, what is going to be the minimum standard for those workers. There is absolutely nothing stopping this government in their negotiation with Medivy from saying uh, as part of, or having a condition as part of that uh, agreement that is set, that there will be standards for workers. They will be paid a certain wage Equal at least, equal at least, that's what I'm calling for here, at least with our neighboring provinces as part of that agreement, that those standards will be set and that Medivy will be required to meet those requirements. It's not only on the union's shoulders to make sure that uh, that these, uh, that they are meeting their, you know, that they're able to, uh, to get us a decent wage. Um, I also want to point out, we keep hearing about how, uh, um, you know, we're training more paramedics, and that is really important. There's no doubt that's an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, I really do want to stress that. Uh, but it's really just not the only piece of the puzzle. It is, in fact, um, incomplete in many ways, because if you train new paramedics and you don't have retain your existing staff, the staff that have years and years of experience in the field that can support those new, uh, you know, new paramedics who are just coming into the field, uh, because it is a really, it is a high stress job, there's no doubt. Um, and, you know, when you don't have that, uh, 
the the paramedics with the experience to be there to support those new staff. Um, you know, not only is that terrible for the new staff coming in, uh, you're going to have problems retaining those new staff. They're going to burn out very quickly if they don't have that support. They also just don't have the experience uh, and knowledge to know how to uh, to address all situations because they haven't been there yet. They haven't experienced it. And I honestly can't imagine, you know, when you think about some of the things that our paramedics have to face, you know, day in and day out in, in the line of, of, of their work, the absolute heartbreaking heartbreaking situations when they're, you know, arriving at, a, a, let's say, a car accident or at a situation where there's um, a, a child who has been injured. Um, you know, I can imagine any number of situations that are incredibly difficult and challenging for paramedics to, to, uh, to manage and to deal with emotionally and to not have that experience, uh, you know, to not focus on retention of, of our workers is, is it's, a, it's a huge gap. Um, there's, all, there's many other ways that we're really not thinking about the workers here, about the actual paramedics themselves. And I want to talk about this new float position that we've heard so much about. So th this position that apparently is going to be created or has been created for a paramedic that, uh, or several, that will be positioned who knows where on the island every day. They will float to wherever they're needed. Um, I got to say, we are struggling to recruit enough paramedics already. Um, to add this extra layer onto that job isn't going to make it easier to recruit paramedics. That's not a, a, a bonus to some one day be signed up in Tignish and one day be signed up in Surrey and, you know, to not know where you're working. We already have a casual pool of paramedics that can be, um, they can then choose when they're, where they're going to work and what shifts they're going to fill. So really, you know, the flow position is is not, not, a, not something that any paramedic uh, would really want to uh, to take on, particularly when we have so many other positions open yet to fill. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense from a recruitment and retention perspective. One more thing I want to touch on here is that we have uh, extended the roles of paramedics into several other areas on the island. So I'm thinking about mobile, you know, integrated health, mobile mental health. Um, they've worked in the ER at the Prince County Hospital. And can the paramedics do that work? Yes. Are they qualified to do it? Yes. Are they capable? Absolutely. But Mr. Speaker, nobody can do, you know, two things at once. They can't be in two places at once. We don't have enough paramedics to do the essential job that they are needed for. So, you know, as we continue to parcel off pieces of our healthcare system and privatize them, and that is what we are doing when we assign paramedics who work for a private company for Medivy, when we assign them new jobs in our healthcare system that they were not responsible for before, that is then privatizing those services. We're just whittling away at our public health care system. And Mr. Speaker, I can't tell you enough that uh, privatization of health care is not something that I will ever support. It is not the way that we should be, you know, it is not the way we should be providing our health care services. So uh, Mr. Speaker, I just, I wanted to, uh, to again just say that I, I fully support this motion. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the things when you privatize a, a service in healthcare in particular, when you take that step, it is hard to go back. It's not easy. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, this is something that I've brought up in, in, in different ways on different topics, but once you do privatize it, it's, um, it's hard to step back. So it is going to require some work to do this, but it is absolutely worth it. We have to recognize when, quite honestly, a mistake has been made. If we had, uh, at the point when Medivy uh, took over uh, all paramedic services on the island, if we had, instead of uh, um, taking the separate services that were available and, and giving it all to Medivy, if at that time we had made it a, a island-wide public service, uh, public paramedicine services, we would be so much better off now. Um, we didn't do that. So now it's harder, but it's not impossible and it's absolutely critical that we do it as soon as we can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, it's an honour today and uh, rise to talk about the, this motion and uh, thank you to the opposition for, for bringing this motion. Uh, thank you, Honourable Member from Mirror <coughs> Stratford. I know you're uh, very passionate about this and, uh, and uh, I certainly appreciate you taking this to the, to the floor. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it, we all know there, there's an issue right now and I think everybody uh, in this legislature today would ad admit there's an issue with uh, services here in Prince Edward Island. And uh, I'll be honest, in, in this side over here in the role I play, I can't tell you um, of, of where it went wrong or what year it went wrong or what could have been done prior or, or, or what needs to, to be done now. Um, but I can safely say we, we all know there's an issue and, and it needs to be addressed and it needs, needs to be fixed. Um, I do want to take the time to, to thank um, all health care providers in Prince Edward Island, especially over this last two years and, and what they've gone through. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of positions and the roles they played that uh, that's not what they signed up for, Mr. Speaker. And, and uh, I can't thank them enough uh, for, for everything they've done and everything they can continue to do because uh, there's lots of issues happening right now in the, in the health care side of it. And uh, we all hear about them every day. And, and there's ones that, uh, that you never hear about that, that, that are brought to light as well, Mr. Speaker. Um, I also want to, I, I do want to thank the Minister of Health. And I, I can't stress enough how challenging that role must be to be Minister of Health. It, uh, it's probably the toughest portfolio in government. Um, I've seen many ministers uh, sit in that seat and have had many, many struggles. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, it would be a challenge. And uh, I just know uh, for myself, and this, this is speaking for, for myself, Mr. Speaker, when, when a lot of these issues in, in my own portfolio um, take place and, and uh, they wear on you, you, you take them home, um, um, when you close your eyes at night, you think about them, things that you cannot fix uh, quickly. And, and it, it's, a, it's a real tough role. And I'll be honest, for the longest time, I really strugg struggled in this role mentally myself because uh, I'm the type of person that takes my, my work home. And I can only imagine what the Minister of Health, uh, when he gets home at night, um, with these issues that, that have been evolving over health care, um, I'm sure he doesn't close his eyes uh, quickly when he goes to bed at night, Mr. Speaker. And, and I am truly grateful to, to have him as a colleague because I know his heart is in the right place. Um, I know he's very passionate to, to improve the systems now, uh, not only uh, in, in, in with, the, with this motion, but, uh, but many issues as well, Mr. Speaker. And, and I had a personal conversation with the, the minister today, and, and uh, I know there's stuff that, that the things that the department is, is working on. Um, like I say, I wish I had the knowledge and, and experience that I, I could provide some advice on it to, to, to maybe help the minister out on this. But uh, I am confident that everybody knows that there's an issue. And uh, I'm, I'm confident that, that with doing the right things and making the right changes that uh, this, this will get rectified. Um, I can't imagine uh, somebody that has to wait an hour or two hours for an ambulance, especially with a loved one standing next or sitting next to the, the Mr. Speaker or, or, or in need. And, and uh, I always struggled, uh, I guess, uh, with severe anxiety, Mr. Speaker, when it come, come to health. Uh, I've had my own health ordeals in, in my lifetime. And uh, um, over the last five years, I was, uh, they found an aneurysm, Mr. Speaker. I carry an aneurysm in my, uh, my heart valve right now. And for the longest time, I was scared to do anything. I was scared to leave the house. I was scared to pick my child up because I was scared it was going to rupture. And uh, I, them are the things I always think of, which, uh, which probably uh, I shouldn't be thinking, Mr. Speaker, uh, but, but they do. And, uh, and it wasn't all that long ago, Honorable Member, when we were talking no ambulances. And I'm thinking of my own personal situation. If something happened to me today, then, then what's going to happen? Um, so I, I think we can, we can say we, we all know that there's an issue, and, and uh, I'm quite confident saying that between everybody in here, uh, we will get rectified. Um, I'm a firm believer that uh, the opposition, uh, they, they have a role to play in hold government accountable. Uh, they do have a role to, to, to play in providing good ideas uh, to help fix this problem as well, Mr. Speaker, as well as a third party. Uh, and I think there's, a, there's a, enough smart people in this legislature, Mr. Speaker, um, and I think we can prove that uh, we can make good ideas work no matter what side of the, the house we're on. Um, and once again, I, I know the minister and his department are, are working very, very hard in this, and, and uh, I'm going to do what I can to, to support the minister and, and uh, try and uh, 
to get this rectified as quick as we can, Mr. Speaker, because every day that goes by is uh, is, is one too many days. So uh, I'm committed on, on this side of the House to, to work with my colleague and, uh, and do the best we can to speed this process up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member from Morale, Donna, and the Government House Leader. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, good debate, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, I want to give uh, credit to the opposition uh, for this motion, and also uh, how it's worded as well. I remember when we were in opposition, you were always trying to just just get that right, walk that line of like directing government to spend on something, but also urging them so it falls within the rules of the assembly. So, just uh, from a crafting uh, message, uh, whoever did craft this, uh, whatever uh, uh, honourable member from. Mermaid Stratford. Well done with the uh, the there force because it just walks the line of urging to do something permanently. So it's uh, it's uh, well done that way. Um, I uh, a couple of things, Mr. Speaker. I talked to the paramedics actually after uh, uh, getting this motion, and I want to hear from them because uh, you know it's a big move to go to. Uh, uh, transitioning into uh, into the public health care system, and and this as as I as I pointed out, this isn't just uh, urging government to consider moving it to uh, to the public health system. It's actually uh, urging them to prepare a plan to move to. So like you know, um, it's it's more significant than than most motions I'll say because if you're voting in favor of this, it means you want to go to a public health care uh, model, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so that was, you know, that's something that I'm not as familiar with uh, uh, on how that process would undertake and and the, the benefits of it, uh, positive and negative. I mean, everything that's in this motion is 100 percent. It's the things that many of us are hearing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I talked before about, you know, uh, whether I was supposed to or not. Uh, I felt like I was right there in the heat of the moment with, with the, the ping pong back and forth uh, with paramedics. And it was... I mentioned on the floor of the legislature, it was one of the most intense calls that I, I was ever on, and I really appreciated it because you know those paramedics, you know, probably shouldn't be doing it, but they want to get that message out, and and uh, to the point of the member from Mermaid Stratford, uh, they're going to great lengths uh, to get this message out, and, and I appreciate that. Um, I understand there was, there was a, a call with I think I'm not sure it was with the new general manager or somebody uh, previously. And they were acknowledging that you know we, we hear these concerns loud and clear. So um, increased paramedic salaries, boom, you know that that makes sense. And, and I've asked the, the minister that as well. You know, can we intervene? Can what can we do to do that? And, and understand that they're they're trying everything they can to to, to try and and within the, the parameters to, to to try and make that happen. But when I was speaking to uh, the paramedics, um, uh, I was surprised. Uh, they weren't necessarily in favor of moving it into to the public health care system, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I mean, you know, it's only two people's views, but they thought maybe 50-50 would be better. Because they, you know, quite frankly, they pointed out their colleagues in the public system are under the same stresses. Uh, you know, they, they don't necessarily see that as a move to a better system, whether it would be, you know, nurses or LPNs or overworked, not getting uh, the, the things that they want in the public health care system, Mr. Speaker. And I know everyone is working as, as hard as they can or, or, or trying to to get the best results, but that was one of the concerns is that they, they talk with their health care professionals in the public system all the time, and uh, it wasn't something that they necessarily wanted to get into. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I have to weigh that. Um, Let's go back to you know to the to the you know regardless if it's private or public we know the issues I, I think are boiling down to loud and clear uh, from what I'm hearing and I know we're all hearing from from different people and different perspectives but the work conditions number one being able to take vacation staff morale not just being paid out for vacation sure that's a giant check Mr. Speaker at the end of of a year but that's not good long term. You need those days off. You can't continue to keep work coming in on your days off and not being able to take vacation. That's, that is not what we need for our health care providers, especially ones that are exposed to such trauma all the time, Mr. Speaker. Um, wages are right up there with work conditions. And, you know, quite frankly, the, the, the people that I spoke to, if we could fix, you know, the, the, the work conditions and the wages, they said no to a public system and yes to a private system. So, though if, we, if they could fix those two things right there tomorrow, 
that's what they want. So that I, you know, and I know not everybody would think that, but that, I'm taking that uh, under under advisement. Uh, the other things that we've heard talked about uh, a lot from some of the private messages and, and some of the push in the legislature is about the transparency of the data and the accountability of, of, uh, of the department and accountability of, of the company of sharing that information too. So, you know, work conditions, wages, transparency and accountability are the four messages that I'm getting, Mr. Speaker. And uh, so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know. Um, how uh, that aligns, you know, is, is going to a public system the way to fix that? Uh, certainly, by the, the couple people that I was speaking uh, with, they didn't. They didn't personally feel that. They said, "No, let's address these things and and help force the companies to to enforce these things." And then they want it to stay in a, in a private uh, a private nature, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, but like I. I think it's dependent, it's, it's, I think it would be responsible of Health BEI or the Department of Health that they're always considering this option. We've got one provider, there's not a lot of options out there, so I think we still need to be looking at it. Um, not, not necessarily immediately, you know, or putting in the, in the plan to transition to public health care system, but I think we need to be understanding of what that would look like. I think we need to be thinking about it as an option. I just don't, I don't think I support this last, this last clause where it's immediately uh, planning to transition, Mr. Speaker, simply because of some of the things I say. I think it's, it's probably premature to, to do that before we speak to a number of the, uh, you know, I think it'd be, if I was in the minister's shoes, I think it would be irresponsible to go ahead and, and say yes to this before I did those other things. It may very well be an option for sure, but I think that you've got to to uh, talk to the necessary uh, components, and certainly speaking with the pair, some of the paramedics, uh, that it was the case with them. So, Mr. Speaker, I am um, going to encourage or uh, continue to encourage uh, privately and publicly uh, uh, the minister and, and the government to do what we can uh, as quickly as we can to for the work conditions. And when I speak about work conditions. Um, it's uh, the, the vacation time, it's staff morale, it's the, it's the lack of employees uh, taking care of the transfers, the, the wages, the transparency of the data, and the accountability, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, so with that, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to keep, in, uh, I'm going to keep uh, pressuring government to do that. Um, but the way this is written, and after speaking with some of the paramedics, I'm, I'm not going to support the motion, but I certainly support uh, uh, the option of having it there, and also, but fixing these things first, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Do you want to adjourn debate with the second? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I'll, uh, with that, I'll adjourn debate, uh, seconded by the member from Montague Kilmer. Should I carry? There. The Honourable Member from Larry Inverness and the Third Party Whip. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Member from Charlottetown uh, West Royalty that the 29th Order of the Day be now read. Should I carry? Yeah. Order 29, an act to amend the Real Property Tax Act, Bill Number 123, in committee. The Honourable Member from Larry Inverness, Third Party Whip. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honourable Member of Charlottetown uh, West Royalty that the House do now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? The Honourable Member from Tignish Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker, to chair the committee of the whole House, please.
The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the bill to be intitulated an act to amend the Real Property Tax Act. Honourable members, when we left off on this bill, we were debating an amendment, and we are that is still in progress. Are there any further questions on the amendment? Shall the amendment carry? Yeah. Carry. Okay, carry. So we're going back to the uh, bill as amended. Any questions? Leader to third party. The member for bringing this bill forward. Um, I know this was probably mentioned before, but the Minister of Finance had the jurisdiction to waive tax bills during COVID and let people give them time to pay their bill. So it would be no different than being able to waive interest. They would have the same authority, would they not? Well, my, once again, my understanding is in talking to the tax commissioner that there would have to be an amendment to the legislation, which is what we're proposing here, that would allow them to waive the penalties or fees. So, uh, but you're correct in saying that uh, in 2020, the, the uh, tax uh, bills were deferred for at least one month. So just to clarify that, that point. So, uh, so once again, I'm going by the understanding that the, without this legislation, uh, they can't waive the interest rates for, the, uh, for a penalty. Leader III. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I have no questions. I, I'd say uh, pass the bill. Yeah. Any further questions? Uh, social development and housing. Uh, thanks, Chair. And um, apologies to, for this question, but can you just uh, restate what the amendment was again? The amendment has already been carried. I know. I want to know what it is while we're debating the, the bill as it stands with the amendment. I know it's been carried, but it I want to... It's been and you also have a copy of it. <laughs> so you don't know what it is either. All right, I don't feel so bad then. No, I don't need it in front of me. This, the amendment has been carried. So yeah. moving on, do you have a question regarding the bill as amended? Um, I want to know what the bill is as amended. The bill is in front of you. The amendment was handed out to you. Do you have a question on the bill as amended? Okay. Shall the bill carry? Yeah. Carry. Justice. Sure we'll <laughs> <laughs> <Trust us. laughs> <laughs> Justice is fine. <laughs> I move the title. An act to amend the Real Property Tax Act. Shall it carry? Carry. I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill agreed to with amendment. Shall it carry? Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the bill to be intitulated an act to amend the Real Property Tax Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same with amendment. I move the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall it carry? Honorable members, a standing vote was asked. Sergeant, okay. Sergeant Arms, you may ring the bell.
The honorable member from Morrell. No? The opposition is ready for the vote. <laughs> the third party is ready for the vote. Honorable members, we're voting on the adoption of the report. I have a clarification question on sending it back to committee. Is that an appropriate time to ask that right now? Not right now, not, not during the recorded division. But. On third reading, you can ask to it to go back. On third reading. So we, it's when it's being read, then you can stand up. As soon as it's read, you can stand up before it's carried. Okay. So if, if this, if this vote, uh, if this vote did not pass, does it go back to debate in second reading? No. Is it put back to the committee of the whole? No. So the only way to go back to the committee of the whole is to vote at third reading? No, I, know, I understand, yeah. You want to make sure that you're, it's clear. clear as... We'll take a short recess. And, yeah. I don't know, we want everybody in the same...
Honourable members. <coughs> I remember there is a question before the House to adopt or reject the report of the Committee of the Whole House on Bill 123. Pending on the result of the vote, there is an opportunity to recommit the bill at third reading. So it depends on how you vote on the bill today, whether it comes back to committee or is rejected. So there is a recorded division. I will now ask the question. All those against the bill? Oh, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. Against the report as adopted, please stand. The Honorable Member from Cornwall Meadowbank, the Honorable Minister of Fisheries and no the Honorable Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier, the Honorable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action, the Honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, the Honorable Member from Charlottetown Winslow, the Honorable Member from Montague Kilmuir, the Honorable Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Land and Minister of Justice and Public Safety, the Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, the Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing, and the Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. All those in favor of voting for the report as adopted, please stand. The Honorable Member from Morrell Dona. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the Honourable Leader of the Third Party, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition, the Honourable Leader, or pardon me, Member from Summerside Wilmot, the Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Victoria Park, the Honourable Member from O'Leary Inverness, the Honourable Member from Tignish Palmer Road, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Brighton, the Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, and the Honourable Member from Summerside South Drive. Honourable Member, your bill has been adopted. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty and the Third Party House Leader. Um, before I, I'm, I'm going to call a motion. Before I call that, Mr. Speak, can I ask you to consider um, we, we lost 10 minutes of time during recess? Nope. Okay. Um, uh, right now, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to call motion number 98, exploring a, a, a modernized approach to election signages to the floor. Shall I carry? Carry. I think that was a me. <laughs> not hard, not hard, maybe. The member for Tignish Palmer Road moves, seconded by the member for O'Leary Inverness, the following motion. <coughs> Whereas election signage has been used in election campaigns across Canada since the 1940s. And whereas there is little scholarly evidence available to suggest that a candidate's election signage has any correlation to their success in an election. And whereas the way election campaign advertising is conducted has evolved substantially over the years, with individuals and political parties now relying heavily on social media outlets to engage with constituents and share their platforms and views. And whereas election signage creates environmental concerns because signage that cannot be recycled will end up contributing to landfills. And whereas candidates running in elections strategically placed signage in high volume traffic areas to gain the most exposure, often resulting in a cluster of signage from multiple parties at a busy intersection, at busy intersections, traffic circles, and junctions that can be distracting or partially obstruct the view for motorists, creating safety concerns for drivers and pedestrians. Therefore, we resolve that the Legislative Assembly commit to exploring an approach to election signage that reflects our modern day communication platforms and addresses concerns of environmental sustainability and safety on island roads. 
The Honourable Member from Tignes Pomeroy to the start debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Every day we see examples of how our world is changing and evolving, some for the better, some not so much. It can be hard to keep up with all the latest trends, norms and practices across many areas of our, day I don't need that, sorry. Yeah. our daily life. Um, each day we are also reminded of ways that our world has not evolved and how in certain situations it seems we are still stuck in the Stone Age. I believe that our usage of election signage is, in this province is one of those examples where we, we are stuck in the Stone Age. My intention on bringing this motion to the floor is so we can start a conversation about how we can evolve our province's practices with election signage and also give us an opportunity to reflect on our own usage um, during past elections and think of ways that we can do it better. As I mentioned, our province, country and world has made significant progress on changing and creating new laws and policies to ensure the safety of citizens and for the protection of our environment. Somehow, those evolutions are not reflected in the laws and policies that govern our PI election signage. Election signage makes up a large part of political history in Canada, dating back to the 1940s. But the way people communicate today has changed. Gone are the days where everyone read the newspaper and checked the community bulletin board for their information. Today it's Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, emails, letters, where, um, where letter, or, uh, email letters, sorry, where people go to communicate and get their information, which we all, knows, we all know has its pros and its cons. However, the reality is we have all come to rely on these social media and internet platforms in one way or another and, when used appropriately, are useful. A useful way to get information out to a wide um, audience. We see that firsthand during the pandemic with all the COVID updates and communications. Politics is no exception to this. Political parties of all stripes heavily rely on social media platforms to connect with their supporters and promote their campaigns and platforms. What we've seen happen with this is that political parties added social media as a valuable asset to their campaign marketing strategies while not offsetting this approach with a reduction in the amount of fiscal signage use. use. The overall effectiveness of election signage is still under debate among experts as well. In a 2016 study from Columbia University, they found that election signage increased the amount of overall votes for each candidate, but in turn did not influence the overall result of the election. A local po political science professor at UPI, Peter McKenna, also said in a 2019 Halifax Today article, and I quote, in an age of climate change and plastic bans, it, it may be time for Canadians to take a closer look at this issue of whether signs are really needed and if there is a better way in our connected world today. Which brings me to another point on why I brought this motion forward, climate change. There was Little information available in terms of studies on how much election signage actually contributes to our landfills and waste. But the reality is, election signage that cannot be reused by a candidate goes into our landfills and hurts our environment. A study was done in 2017 following the BC provincial election to examine the amount of waste produced by election signage. During the study, 1,000 pounds of signage was available to be diverted from landfills and recycled. The municipality of York and Ontario implemented a, an election signage recycling campaign back in 2006. 2015, it was reported that since that time, this program has diverted 20 tons of election signage from landfills. So while we don't have the exact figures or a PEI perspective, it is safe to say that these two studies paint a picture of how signage contributes to landfills and realistically any contribution to landfills, uh, to landfills as a result of an election being held is actually horrible to begin with. In a province that, that sets lofty goals for climate action, this is an area where we really need to put more effort into it. The final ambition for bringing this motion forward is for personal safety in islanders, of all islanders. I'm sure we can think of areas within our districts from past elections where election signage became cluttered at corners, roundabouts, intersections, creating a situation where a driver's view was partially obstructed or made for a risky situation for pedestrians. We see this far too often during both the federal and provincial elections. The root of this part of the problem stems from 
um, not having stricter laws in our province around election signage placement or the amount of signs a candidate is allowed to have. In fact, it was found that not one jurisdiction in Canada did. Election sign placement in PEI is primarily the responsibility of each municipality. This creates an issue for many reasons in terms of fairness and equity among candidates running in areas without bylaws around election signage. Differing bylaws by, by municipalities um, and when dealing with areas of the province that are unincorporated all have uh, created an issue, Mr. Speaker. When you look across the country in terms of a jurisdictional scan of how other provinces are tackling this topic, it shows that PEI is not alone in being behind the times on election signage. So I see this as an opportunity for PEI to be seen as a leader on this. Mr. Speaker, to conclude my remarks on this motion, I just want to say that I think this is a conversation that is long overdue among politicians here on Prince Edward Island. I think we have a responsibility to ensure that while we are working and campaigning to get the privilege of sitting in these chairs at the Legislative Assembly, that in doing so, we are not putting our constituents at risk or our environment. I am I'm looking forward to hearing what other members of this House uh, have to say in regards to this topic, and I also hope that the discussion had here today can serve as a, can serve as a starting point to making policy changes in the election signage on Prince Edward Island that reflect the modern times that we live in. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Larry Inverness and the Third Party Whip. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I too uh, want to uh, happy to second this particular uh, motion by the member from Tignish uh, Palmer Road, Mr. Speaker. And obviously, when a motion comes forward, we've had uh, some ample discussion within our caucus and uh, on the, this particular issue. And I too feel that uh, the whole issue around election signage and signs, it, it uh, a lot of it seems to be unnecessary. It's wasteful. Uh, I've, I've. Uh, Felt that you know, it's. I know we all, as we election and we campaign, it's it's difficult to raise funds for elections, and you know we put money into uh, the signs component. There's a budget for that, and I know in my own district, uh, uh, when I get into the issue around lawn signs, I believe we had a budget of a hundred lawn signs for my district for the entire election, and of course every party and every candidate tries to come up with certain strategies and how you try to do you put them all at once at the first or do you wait till the end or do you uh, uh, you know when do you put them out and where do you put them out and one of the uh, policies that I sort of had within my own election campaign was that I did not want signs on roads I wanted them in the the, the lawns uh, for where people actually you know would have a sense that they were actually displaying their support for a particular candidate and uh, you know, so, but I had opponents, you know, one particular opponent, his whole campaign was about the sign. No matter, it was all about the sign. He would, he would go in and put, uh, I would say, unnecessary pressure on, uh, on, I'll say, vulnerable people that maybe wouldn't be able to advocate or speak for themselves to put the sign up. And once he got that commitment, he was gone off to the next house to try to do the same thing. And I'd come along to some of these places, and once I kind of caught on to, I always kind of used the, the uh, policy in my own mind anyway, if there was a sign, a person that's indicating a support for a particular candidate, that means that their mind is made up and they're supporting that particular candidate. I didn't feel it necessary to put on due pressure uh, uh, by showing up and trying to debate the whole issues and stuff like that. So, uh, so, uh, but then I started to get a sense that people were calling me up and saying, well, don't, don't, don't go by the sign out in the front of the yard. <laughs> uh, drop in, drop in and see me. I want to see you. So that seemed a bit bizarre in, in lots of ways. So, so I would go in to visit people and, and kind of got the whole concept of how that particular candidate was uh, focused on the sign so much and really didn't want to listen to the candidate or to the constituent and hear their concerns. And uh, so that kind of gave me some reason to say that, you know, may, maybe this isn't a real true indication of people's uh, preferences of candidates and is it, a, is it an appropriate election strategy and being all about the sign. And then I've also had ca campaigns and I've, I guess I've had five campaigns and I've been successful in four of them and feel honoured and privileged by the people of Valeria Inverness to allow me to uh, represent them in this floor of this hallowed chamber. And, uh, 
But when I'd see, you know, candidates that uh, they may be late uh, uh, nominating things out, and all of a sudden they'd have a whole pile of election signs all right up to the polling station along the road. And everybody's, oh, gee, they must be doing awful good. They get a lot of signs. And, you know, then, and find out they, would, they didn't even get the vote, so the amount of signs they had, it, it was just, uh, it, seemed, it seemed like a, a, quite a waste of, uh, of effort and time and volunteers' time and a manipulation of people's uh, uh, democratic rights in, in that regard. Um, so that's why I'd always been a, an advocate to say, didn't, I would tell all my uh, volunteers, don't put signs up along the side of the road, intersections and those kinds of things. But I do, but I, the one thing I did like about signage, I did, I did feel that it's important to indicate where your boundaries of your riding are, and I'm sure that's more difficult in a more uh, municipal, uh, uh, bigger areas or more concentrated areas. In a riding like mine, you know, it's quite spread out. You see a sign and you might drive for 40 minutes before you're going to see the next uh, boundary line sign. But I did find that that was always important, so I always tried to strategize around having my larger signs, my 4x4s, my 4x8s on our boundary lines. Uh, when you'd enter the district, and that's who the, you know, I was the candidate for that area. And it was to try to help inform the public to say, okay, if they are going to vote, when you look at the ballot, these are the people. And usually, where we'd have a sign up, there would be all the other candidates who do the same thing at the boundary lines. I didn't have a problem with that. Um, but, you know, when I looked at the, uh, you know, we, uh, the cost of 100 signs, and that seems to be going up all the time, and then when we try to figure out ways to reduce that cost, and we'd go from a four by uh, just a smaller sign, and we'd try to cut that into half to make it a little smaller to try to get more signs, and it just seems like a, a lot of energy, time, effort, money wasted uh, that wouldn't necessarily be that uh, advantageous to the outcome of the election. And, uh, you know, for those reasons is why I think this is a worthy uh, subject to debate here in this legislature and try to get an indication on people's uh, preferences on, on how they utilize their, their money and spending. And, you know, you also wonder where this can lead in future. I mean, are we going to go to uh, signs that have flashing lights around them? Are we going to go to where we spend electricity uh, to uh, highlight these lights and, uh, or these signs with lighting and things of that nature? And, you know, so I think it's kind of important that we uh, have a good discussion on it. So this is fair to everybody, all parties, all candidates. And, uh, you know, uh, those are the kind of the rationale and reasoning why I think uh, that we kind of look at this. Uh, you know, I, I, I certainly find uh, the same thing as, you know, we're going to get into these issues around social media. Social media, is, it becomes a, a way the, that we can uh, get information out to our uh, constituents. But even that, you know, sometimes you don't even know what's real in social media anymore. And, uh, and people, there's trolls out there, they're hacking it. I don't know, it's, it, it seems like we're heading in a dangerous direction as, uh, as elected officials here and how we advocate and uh, promote our causes. And uh, I don't know how, you know, I don't, certainly don't have all the solutions and all the, the answers. I know everybody will always try to take an advantage of a situation to try to get ahead of a, an opponent. And this is, it's a, it's a tough game, this. It's tough to, to get elected. It's tough to uh, go through the effort and the hours that it takes uh, to uh, be successful in, in uh, the electoral uh, battlefield. And uh, I've, uh, you know, been successful a number of times, but, uh, and, I've, and I've seen it change over that period of time. I mean, from my perspective, I always think it's very important to try to get to every house. Uh, it's a big challenge in a rural riding. I, I can remember talking to a colleague, uh, his name was Richard Brown, and he would say he could go around his entire district uh, in, uh, and be home for lunch, <laughs> go around the, the geographical perimeter of his district. Well, you know, I, 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 it takes me every waking hour and day to try to get to every house in my district, Mr. Speaker, when I'm campaigning. And the reason is it's probably a five-minute drive between each house, the laneways. There's not a lot of uh, apartment buildings in the ride to Valeria and Furness. And, uh, you know, so I know we have to try to figure the, these things out. But when I look at the perspective of probably having uh, a thousand homes, and yet I've only got a hundred signs in, in total, you know, as a budget. Now, yes, I can put more money into signs. I get all that. I can have more signs and, and uh, less other uh, services. But I do think it's important to uh, focus on getting to uh, talk to your constituents, know your constituents, and and uh, to try to uh, versus trying to put pressure on them just about putting a sign up in your yard. And uh, so that's why I'm saying that I think lots of these things tend to be a bit redundant 
and uh, I think it's important that we try to uh, debate this particular subject, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, so with that, Mr. Speaker, I certainly feel that the, the honourable member has a good motion here, and uh, I'm certainly curious to hear what uh, others would uh, weigh in on this. I'm certainly very open-minded about the subject, uh, but I know from my perspective I would be more than content to not have to see signs on uh, roadways, other than I do feel that there's some value in signs to <laughs> signify your riding boundaries. And, you know, I have a riding boundary with the member from Albert and uh, uh, Bloomfield. Uh, I have another one with Evangeline Muskush and the, from uh, Tyne Valley Sherbrooke. I border on those, those three ridings, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I, I will say, I know I remember the member from uh, Albert and Bloomfield, we had a conversation about signs. Uh, you know, remember what side of the road's my riding <laughs> And, and and it worked out great. I, I, yeah, no, I, I, exactly. It's a, it is about trying to, so we don't confuse uh, constituents. Uh, the other issue I, I've seen about signs, and uh, these are the good and the bad of it all, Mr. Speaker, but unfortunately, uh, after the outcome of the election, I remember we kind of go and we try to put a little thank you on, on some of our borderline uh, signs that when people come to our riding. Unfortunately, there's a few opponents that don't quite, uh, aren't so... Uh, uh, excited about the fact that you've been elected, and then they tend to like to deface those signs. Uh, I can remember one sign uh, that I had. <laughs> it was it, actually it's in the member of Albert and Bloomfield's riding now. But anyway, I'm driving <laughs> driving out uh, after the election, and the sign it's up on about a pyramid of hay bales. I don't want to say what was on it. It wasn't quite good, but uh, it did say I suck. But anyway, but oh. I'll go further than that. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, and it flags are out. No, and it definitely this was a previous election from the member from Alvin Bloom. For that, he's an honourable member and, and was a was a, a good neighbour in, in our campaigning strategies and stuff. So I, I certainly appreciate all of that. And I'd say that to any person out there. But sometimes we have over, like I said, we have an overzealous postmistress in Ellishley, and we also can have over zealous supporters and uh, opponents in campaigns and that's unfortunate that that happens but that's but that's such a it's such a hassle and have to deal with all that stuff like you know the, the defacing of a sign and is it is that legal and, and uh, you know all the things every election we see the same thing over and over again so so I would certainly like to see some uh, some you know rules around election signage if nothing else and uh, uh, if it's an eradication of all signs I, I could certainly live with that too but uh, if I was to advocate, I like to see the idea of signs for signifying riding boundaries, but not so much uh, lawn signs and uh, signs, these little smaller signs along roads and intersections. And I do feel there's safety issues that come with that because invariably if there's a wind, they're blowing over and your, your volunteers have to go out and try to uh, uh, reinforce them and nobody wants to have a sign all, you know, twisted over and looking silly, uh, you know, so and I think it's always an indication that you've got good organization when you can get your signs back up quick after a wind or, or if there's a big storm comes in. Uh, I think the next election is scheduled for the fall of 2023. That's not so bad. You, you can usually deal with uh, signs a little easier than if it's in the spring where you have snow and frozen ground and trying to get the signs into the ground and uh, all that gets very complicated. It seems to be a lot of redundant work on behalf of uh, of all of the uh, volunteers that we all face, and I think that's uh, those are the types of things that I feel is important that we uh, make sure that we're trying to uh, do our very best in discussing this subject and seeing if there is a modern approach that we can put into our election signs and uh, figure this out in this legislature. And I feel a motion is a good way to start the discussion. I think it uh, allows uh, to get a greater view of opinions than just my own and, uh, and uh, the mover of the, the uh, motion here. And, uh, you know, if, if we do see that there are things that could be done, you know, maybe it's something that we can eventually get into uh, legislation or an act uh, with elections PEI to make sure that they uh, have clear indications uh, uh, of, uh, of signage and, and how it's uh, monitored. I know, I remember, uh, once again, another opponent was very uh, overzealous in getting their signs up before the election writ was dropped in the last election, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, and the, and the district returning officer had to deal with these types of things, and the individual had to go back, and they're taking their signs down, and then they go back up again, and it was, it was just a, a lot of stuff. I, I guess, for me, I was very fortunate, because as an incumbent, you tend to know the rules a little better, and I'm not saying that any candidate was trying to jump ahead of one or the other, but these things happen, and it gets complex. And I think we can, you know, certainly look at coming up with maybe more uh, simpler ways of uh, of trying to uh, 
you know, develop a policy or concentrate on how election signage should uh, uh, be evolved moving forward, Mr. Speaker. And I'm sure the district returning officers all across the island would be appreciative of clarity on a, on a uh, policy around election signage. Um, and, uh, and I wouldn't doubt the elections PEI itself. Uh, Tim Garrity would probably feel the same too, because like I say, it can be complex and, and uh, you know, these are the types of uh, challenges that we will all be faced. But, uh, but election signs, you know, like I say, you, everybody's trying to get their color and they're trying to figure out, uh, you know, different shades to make it look different every year. Uh, um, you know, I was always wondering, can you use the same sign again? You know, that was a, another issue that uh, some of the candidates running against me, he's looked an awful lot younger. He's probably 25 years younger in the picture than, <laughs> than he actually was. But like <laughs> so, you know, that, these are the types of things that uh, is, is seeing, believing, and uh, yes, we're all trying to manipulate that to a certain degree. But, uh, you know, I found that, uh, that a little bit uh, Challenging, and I, I remember going to one house, and the candidate uh, or the c constituent said, "Gee, when that guy came in, he looked he looked really old compared to what his pictures are." I think they might have been saying that about me sometimes too, Mr. Speaker, because I will say politics does uh, age us a little bit. And uh, but I've been in this for 15 years, so I guess I'm. I'm uh, 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 it could be expected that I'm going to look a little bit uh, more older than... Uh, and when you're Minister of Health, as a member from Alburn Bloomfield would know, <laughs> it uh, probably takes a few years off your life. And uh, I had uh, two years of that, so if in dog years, that's probably 14 years off my life somewhere along the line. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, so that's why I think these are the types of things that we should be, uh, should be uh, looking at and considering when we uh, talk about election signage, Mr. Speaker. Um, Certainly, I feel that you know we are saying that uh, there are environmental concerns. I think another story that I had, Mr. Speaker, was uh, there was roadside cleanup day in in the riding of O'Leary Inverness, and uh, somebody came along uh, uh, over a bridge and uh, was wasn't the bridge wasn't in my ride. I think it was in the actually the riding of uh, uh, Grand uh, Tyne Valley Sherbrook, and there was a hello and behold a whole bunch of, of O'Leary Inverness. Red signs, uh -oh. all in the in the culver, in the culvert. They threw them over the <laughs> over the river, and uh, you know, as much as they probably would attract oyster spat, they're not going to attract much else. And uh, you know, those are the types of things that uh, that can be an environmental issue because you have a lot of signs. Uh, I know, uh, from my perspective, I use some of the used signs, turn them around, and I'll put something on them around uh, uh, blueberries or something if I'm trying to sell blueberries for you pick. So. So, uh, so anyway, so I don't know how we're getting along here. We're getting close to uh, our time to do uh, a little, little bit more. Three minutes. Okay. Well, we'll we'll certainly see when I use my signs. They are great signs when you try to write stuff on them, Mr. Speaker. You know, I can I can I can put uh, I can certainly put uh, you know my blueberry you pick operation on the sign. I, you know, I try to make use of them so they're not. Uh, Totally uh, destroyed. Yeah, I, I have put some of them in my basement too, uh, just to uh, cover up a patch or something in the ceiling or th something like that. Uh, you know, it's a, they, they have usages, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that there are better uses in ways that we can uh, deal with problems than election signs. So I think uh, so. That's my rationale behind why I am a second in this particular uh, motion, Mr. Speaker, for the safety, for environmental issues for the waste of time and money, for the uh, issues around uh, uh, not putting undue pressure on people just so they can have a sign up doesn't really indicate whether they're actually going to vote for you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, so I'm thinking with that, we probably should uh, conclude the debate and uh, adjourn debate and uh, go on to the next order of business, Mr. Speaker. So I'd like to adjourn debate on the subject of election signing. Uh, seconded by the member of Charlottetown, West Royalty. Sean Carey. Uh, the... Honourable Member from Mackinac Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield to uh, call order number one to the floor. Shona Carey.
Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. The Honorable Member from Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I resolve the committee? Uh, <laughs> I move uh, the committee resolve itself as a committee of the whole. But this House do now resolve itself into committee of the whole House to take into consideration the grant of supply to Her Majesty. Shall I carry? Carry. Honorable Member from Tignish, Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker to Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. This is now the committee of the whole House to take into consideration the grants of supply to Her Majesty. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? granted. Honourable members, we left off on page 41. The section Parks Operations has been read and is currently under debate. Parks Operations. Yeah. Chair? And honourable members, there is uh, some take backs that will be copied and distributed. They are copied. And they are copied, so they'll be uh, distributed to each of you. Would you please state your name and title for Hansard? Yep. Shannon Burke, Director of Finance, Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Okay, thank you, Shannon, and welcome. So, again, page 41, Section Parks Operations. We left off with. O'Leary and Vaness? Yes. Parks Operations? Yeah, just to, uh, I guess I had a conversation recently with the Minister of Transportation regarding uh, uh, Cedar Dunes Park Road, and I know you and I have had that discussion too. Uh, any uh, potential of uh, advocating for that uh, to the other departments to see what we can do to uh, try to achieve that goal? Yeah, certainly, Honourable Member. So uh, I was up last fall and realized that the back entrance into the park is uh, in really rough shape. It's probably one of the worst roads I've seen in a long time. So uh, certainly I don't mind pushing or attracting visitors up there. And uh, I think there should be a, a decent road in, in the back. So uh, I, I sure will bring it up. Oh, Larry and Vanessa. Yeah, and I, I guess uh, not to give the public the rationale why it wasn't done previously, it was because we knew there was going to be a fair bit of work done on uh, the uh, shoreline protection there. So once again, at that time, we didn't know which way they were going to be accessing the, the point. So I felt it was a uh, appropriate to not advocate for getting that road paved, but you're right, it's in bad shape and it needs to do that. Uh, I guess when we uh, went off last time, we were talking a little bit about, uh, once again, some beach cleanup and some trees that have been damaged at uh, Cedar Dunes Park. Is there any indication that some work can be done to plant some trees, but also to uh, remove those ones that are all dead? Yeah, certainly. So we can take uh, take a run up uh, when the house closes. Uh, I know we've done some work and some replantation uh, in Green Park as well. Uh, we have to work with the Department of Environment, but uh, I don't see any issues why we, we can't look forward to doing something there. Well, are we in Vanessa? Uh, that's no further questions. Okay. Uh, Tyne Valley Sherbrooke? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, just looking through the take backs here. Put that down for a minute. Um, so, okay, in uh, 2019, the Auditor General reported that the tourism, uh, tourism PEI had a capital asset plan going until 2022-23. So, um, uh, what work is going to happen this year to produce a new capital asset plan? I don't have that information in front of me, but I can go back. I know the department uh, has been working, uh, and I believe most, if not all, recommendations have been done to date or there's a plan in place for them. Uh, but I, I don't have that info in front of me, but I can take it back. 
Time Valley Sherbrooke. And the Auditor General uh, also uh, noted that there was no strategic plan for the provincial parks. Uh, has one been developed since? I believe if it's not completed, it is in near completion. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Do you have a sense of what the strategic objectives are for the pro for provincial parks? I don't have it right in front of me, but uh, the main goal is is to clean the parks up. They've been neglected for a lot of years, mm -hmm. um, as well as some safety concerns and safety issues, especially with children in the parks. So uh, that's been a, a priority. Like I say, I know a lot of the work has been done, but uh, I don't have uh, an update if, if everything's been done, but I'll uh, more than happy to take it back. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, yeah, no, that's really good to hear, and I know that we've, you know, we've uh, had a dis discussions about the uh, two uh, provincial parks in my district, Green Park and Belmont Park, um, and uh, I think, you know, this is under tourism, but I do want to note that, you know, Islanders you know, use these parks as well. It's a, an important resource for for families and, you know, uh, just individual well-being to be able to go to these green spaces and that they're well-maintained and that there are facilities that are accessible and in good condition, so I'm glad to hear that this is something that's being worked on um, and I would love to to see if you know if there is a, st a strategic plan that has been developed or will soon be you know I'd certainly like to see more on that just one more thing that the auditor auditor general also noted um, that not all parks tested their water in accordance with the environmental protection act um, is that is that accurate are you talking drinking water or ocean water so I don't know if it's specified in, but I'm, I'm thinking Environmental Protection Act is it's probably drinking water. Yeah, yeah so. I, I would want to confirm, but uh, I'm safe in saying that uh, all parks are tested now. Um, but let me let me confirm that. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And how about playground equipment inspections? That was another area that was uh, there was no documentation that those inspections were happening. And do you have that documentation now to show uh, they are? I don't have it in front of me, but I do know the inspections have happened. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, that would be another good take back just to see sure. also how frequently the, those inspections are happening. Um, that's all for now. Thank you, Chair. Okay, shall the section carry? Mark Arendas Provincial Ski Park at Brookvale, appropriations provided for the operation. Mark Arendas Provincial Ski Park at Brookvale, administration 18,200, equipment 30,000, material supplies and services 262,000, professional services 3,100, salary 766,500, travel and training 13,100. Total, Mark Arendas Provincial Ski Park at Brookvale, 1,092,900. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Golf courses appropriations provided for the operation of provincially owned golf courses, including maintenance and marketing of the courses. Administration 153,700, debt 58,000, equipment 39,500, material supplies and services 1,364,100, professional services 9,600, salaries 2,577,500, travel and training 17,000, total golf courses 4,219,400. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Chair. So um, uh, golf course rates have gone up this year, so can you explain the rationale for that decision? Sure. So uh, what was happening, I guess COVID probably spiked it, but we went from 350 memberships to approximately 600 memberships. And by doing so, um, it kind of cre created some uh, not fair situation for, for some members. So even though everybody was paying the same price, you would have some people that couldn't get on the golf course because um, the, they, 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 they were so busy with, uh, with all the memberships as, as well as tourism. So uh, they were changed to, to kind of go by how many rounds you golf. So there's some members that were golfing in the vicinity of 150 rounds that were paying the same price as somebody that golfed 60 rounds. So what we looked at is, is to try and make it fair to get everybody out at, at a certain rate. So what has happened, uh, the more you golf, basically, the more you pay. And there's different uh, different areas as well, uh, as well as we give some senior senior discounts as well. Um, so it's it's to create more fairness is, is what took place. Time Valley Sherbrooke. OK. Um uh, so and, and, and so I can hear what you're saying there. Um, I guess my one sort of concern in that would be that you know uh, lower income islanders who who maybe you know were had bought memberships um, mm -hmm. and are using them, which is is great. Get out, you know, get exercise. Uh, um, something that we hear very often uh, um, from uh, 
member over here. Um, it's, uh, so it could be a very positive, positive thing. I just want to make sure that we're not pricing, uh, you know, lower income islanders or med you know, middle, middle income islanders out of, of that experience. No, d definitely not. And some people are, are actually getting cheaper memberships now. Um, so really the ones that are paying more are the ones that golf more. Um, like I say, when we compared it to all the, the different provincial courses throughout the country, uh, we're still in the vicinity of 50% less than anywhere else. But we want to make sure that all golfers got treated fair because you can imagine if you paid for a membership and you couldn't get on the course, you weren't real happy last year, right? So we had to create some fairness and, uh, and uh, for the most part, uh, obviously there was some pushback by, by a few, but uh, there's more positive than negative on it because uh, a lot of the members now feel it's a, it's a fair, fair approach. Time Valley Sherbrooke. So I do have one other question that was brought to my attention, and it it, it, it may not be what's happening. So I want to just clarify mm -hmm. the uh, the Food Island gift cards. So they could be used at I'm guessing golf course like restaurants and whatnot, right? Yep. And memberships. And well, members. that's where I was going next. Yep. <laughs> Is they were also the Food Island gift cards could also be used for golf memberships? That's right. Yep. Time Valley Sherbrooke. So I guess I'm just, I'm a little confused, and you know, we can come back to this in the next section under the Food Island gift cards, but I'm a little confused about how, you know, using those Food Island, that, like what, how does that fit with the purpose of the, the Food Island gift card program? How does that? Well, it's not necessarily, yes, it's a Food Island gift card, but it was focused on businesses that were hit during COVID. So a lot of the private golf courses really were struggling. Um, early on because we, we didn't have tourists coming in so they were relying on their on their members um, so it you know it was a tourism product that uh, that helped and uh, the private courses were very grateful it helped out their their business as well and and uh, it turned out to be to be a good thing that those courses were able to survive a lot of them private courses are working with small margins you know it depends on the weather and and uh, your season so it, it really helped them get through gold time valley sherbrooke so you know even with the 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 discount that someone would uh, be able to benefit from by using the Food Island gift cards for their membership, it's still a, a fairly big expense. So do you have any data to show that that actually increased memberships or are we just subsidizing folks who are already going to buy memberships and now we're able to use the gift cards to do that? No, there would be some data with the courses. I don't have it with me, but I'm more than happy to go back to tourism. That's one thing we kept track of. I believe there was 300 different, 320 different businesses across PEI that we kept track. Um, every business got a certain, certain amount because there was only so many to, to go around, but we would have all that data. I don't mind bringing that back. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And I guess the follow-up question to that, just generally speaking, is how many memberships are bought by tourists and how many are bought by islanders as well? I would think that you would see more sort of locals getting a full year membership, whereas tourists might come and do the course while they're here. So to me, the purpose of the Food Island gift card was, I, you know, in, in terms of tourism and encouraging and supporting, you know, tourism. I just, I'm not sure I see this no, it, as... No, it, it was both honorable members. Okay, so not yeah. only did we want to... Uh, increased tourism from off island, but we also wanted to keep our locals on the island, right? We wanted uh, locals that weren't traveling to spend their money in PEI, and the locals really stepped up. You've seen we've done a couple campaigns with the chamber as well, that's supporting local. Uh, so that really helped uh, our local population stay instead of traveling. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay. So just, I guess, you know, yeah, if you could, if you have any data, you could bring yep. back on that. I mean, um, I just, my concern, primary concern is that it really was just for the memberships, really subsidizing folks who would have gotten it anyway, because it is a big expense. So if, if you have something to yeah. prove that that's no, not the no, case, I'd love to see Certainly, I'll take back whatever I got. And in, in, in saying that, the numbers prove. So we went from 350 memberships alone in provincial courses to 600. So that happened with all the private sector, right? So all the private sector courses increased their membership because of COVID. So people weren't, uh, so it, it was a good thing because there was a lot of anxiety. You can imagine not only in the tourism business, but with them golf courses as well, whether they were going to be able to open the doors or, or even stay afloat. So uh, from my understanding, it's really helped them out, but I'll bring back whatever information I can get. I'm Ellie Sherbrooke. That's uh, all, Chair. Thank you. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. So I'm just going to add some comments to this. So um, it was shared with me from a small one of the uh, retail outlets where you could purchase the gift cards mm -hmm. that people would come in and basically buy them out not leaving gift cards for other people to come behind and you know 
one of those attendants had said to me, said, told me, you know, they said, well, that pays for my golf membership now. So I think what the idea and the intent yeah. behind it of those gift cards was to spread them out across the island so that not just one or one golf course or whatever yeah. got $1,800 worth of those um, car gift cards, where if you had a $20 gift card, you would go into that establishment with three other people, you'd use your gift card and you'd spend $100, and then it would increase the revenues within those smaller businesses. And I think that's that's I, where the program missed. I agree. No, like and tr truthfully, like I think there was a cap. Now, I don't have that in front of me, but I'm quite confident there was a cap on how many you could buy. So I, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but it's not supposed to somebody being able to go in and buy $1,000 gift cards at one time. Uh, but I'll confirm that I just don't have any notes in front of me. But from my understanding, there was a cap on percentage. How many you could buy? Okay. Mayor May Stratford. Thanks, Chair, and thank you for that, Minister, because I think we can all agree that when yep. somebody has a $20 gift card, the benefit is is that they spend way more than that, but it's an incentive for them to go into that establishment. Definitely. And if you're buying just enough to pay for your membership when you're likely going to buy a membership anyway, um, then it's just giving you a discount on something that you already do. I have to agree with you know that sentiment, and I just think that the it, the exponential value of somebody going in with one gift card to an establishment and spending five times that amount mm -hmm. will show itself in spades of being more beneficial. Than yeah, I agree, and I'll confirm. I'm almost sure there was a cap on it. I just I okay. don't want to give you the wrong answer, so I'll, I'll agree with that. Okay, right. I'm good. Thanks, Chair. Charlotte, how much royalty? Thank you, Chair. Brudenell, Dundrave, and Crowbush are increasing from $1,635 to $2,500. Justify that, Mr. So I just explained that. So what we're doing is going by rounds. Um, so some people would have paid less than that. Um, but what has taken place is people that took out membership couldn't get on the course because some people kept taking... Uh, um, some people were golfing every day uh, that were taken away from, from other people. And then there were some people that had memberships that couldn't get out any time during the run of the week. So it was unfairly done. Uh, so now what we're doing, we're, we're charging by uh, membership by the amount of times you golf. So if you want to golf 50 rounds, here's your membership. If you want to golf 70 rounds, here's your membership. If you want to golf 150 rounds, here's your membership. Cheryl Down West Royalty. But, but that's a huge change to a culture of golf and for the people that are golfing in Prince Edward Island all of a sudden. Would you agree with that? I would uh, agree with that. Um, and I'll be honest, it, it was a bit, but there, it, was, it was being done unfair. So uh, when it was done, and this has been going on long before I ever took this chair, uh, I'm all about treating everybody fair. And that's when we realized there was an issue because somebody was buying a membership and couldn't get on the course. Charles, how much royalty? So that's the concern is that the, pl the, the courses were being overplayed and that people who took out a membership couldn't get on the course. That's the primary reason you did this? No, there's a, a couple of reasons. So one, it was, uh, it was being done unfair. Um, and at the end of the day, these golf courses has been a hot topic um, with taxpayers for years, whether government should even be in the golf course business. So um, when you look at it, the goal is to get eventually to a break-even point because these courses have been losing uh, in the vicinity of a million dollars a year. So there's a whole bunch of factors, but the main one uh, is we wanted to treat people fair. We were getting a lot of complaints from uh, golf much. members that couldn't get on the course. I paid for my membership, but I can't get on until two weeks' time, and that's not fair. Charlotte, West Royalty. Because this is a... Th it's okay to say that, but, I mean, to, to increase... In on the outside, it looks like you're increasing this 53% for Islanders to play golf. For, the, for certain members that golfed every day, which is equivalent to about $8 a day, golfing at one of the finest golf courses in the country, yes. But for somebody that's only golfed 40 rounds, they're actually getting a discount. Charles, how much royalty? Well, yeah, I could say that about my Disney World Pass, too, if I don't go. But, I mean, these are islanders that are using it, and we're trying to promote wellness. Well, we don't have a wellness strategy. These are islanders getting out and using using that, and now they're being punished for wanting to not, play golf. They are not, being punished. They're not being punished. 
So what would you say to the person that couldn't get on the golf course last year? Well, I'm sa I mean, the person that doesn't get on the golf course last year, I mean, you got to make a decision here who, who your base is. We and did. obviously you've made it. Yeah. And I mean, if, if I can't, I don't know if they know how to use the booking system or, or whatever else. Those courses, the, the people that you're talking about are, are people that golf in the in May 1st and they, they continue to go right through. They paid their memberships. They're okay with small increments, mm -hmm. but they're not okay with the 53% in increase to them. There's to very, 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 very few that were affected by that. The majority of the membership is happy with it because they're going to get out more. Sure that was them. the problem. The calls we were getting in were from about 80% of the members that said, we can't get on the course. You need to help us out here. We paid for a membership and we can't get on. How's that fair? Mm -hmm. So there is, I've had approximately about eight calls from disgruntled members, uh, but the majority of calls I've got are positive because now they know that they can get out and get treated fair and get on the course. Charlotte, how much royalty? So it, it's gone up that much, and then more people can play. Does that does this price people out? If people want to play golf, no. does it price people out of, of using our golf no, courses? No, abs absolutely not. And you got to remember, too, honourable member, where we are in a different circumstance with a provincial course is we're competing against the private sector, which I'm not a firm believer government should be competing with the private sector. So what was happening? Even on a, a daily rate, our discounts in golf were so low that we were taken away from the private courses because if you could golf at one of the finest golf courses in the country for $120 uh, and the same private courses offering the same, where are they going to go? So we felt we needed to be fair, one, to the private sector as well, but also to, to the membership. And another thing we were having problems with, you would have a membership uh, book. So they would say, me and my three buddies are coming out for 2 o'clock, they book it, and only two people show up. Uh, my other two buddies couldn't get here. So we had so many uh, bookings that were cancelled that other people could have went out and got. So we had to look after it better. It was, it was the right decision to do. I know it was a hard decision, but it was the responsible one. Cheryl, how much royalty? Hey, my question is, is it just too, too fast? Is, is, is COVID an anomaly? Because a lot of people played last year. If you went to Belvedere, if you went to wherever, all the courses were full last year. So to make your judgment and assessment based on one year is not quite fair. No, but even this year, we've got more bookings this year than we did last year. This is going to be an all-time record high. Um, we're actually probably going to even, the tourists that are coming aren't going to be able to get on the courses. This has been the largest amount of bookings we've had ever uh, in the history of the golf courses uh, for the month of April. They're, we're, we're going to be sold out. Charles, how much are So where are they coming from? Are they coming from off-island or on-island or...? Uh, all over the, all over, yeah, all over. So we're ahead 5,000 rounds compared to 2019 as of today. Cheryl, how much royalty? So where does it leave the person that supported the course for the last 15 years when it was struggling and they have priced, they can't, they can't play anymore, they can't play at the regular thing because everybody's golfing, where does it leave No, that? they can still play, honorable member. So there's just certain diff different, are they going to be able to pay, play 157 rounds for $1,600? No but they can still play 60 rounds at a discounted rate and, and actually it might even be a little, little cheaper. So uh, there was very few people that golfed 150 rounds, but they, them people tied up tee times and took away from other members. Charlotte, how much royalty? Wouldn't it have been better to, to block those tee times off than raising rates 53%? Wouldn't it be better if they have a certain time that they could play? It still, it, it still wouldn't have fixed the issue because you still have the same same amount of people. If if I'm a golfer and I'm golfing every day, uh, I'm still going to book my tee time every. So that's what we've tried to do is make it more more fair, right? Because there was there was some that were, were golfing every day that were, were taking it away. And, um, obviously, it's it's not perfect, but it, we we had to do it because we were having a lot of angry members that couldn't get on the course. I think this is a fantastic debate because I, I wanted to, to have this discussion because it's because constituents of mine are, are I'm getting a lot of messages about exactly kind of what I'm talking about so I'm kind of I'm trying to figure this out and it's been going on for a while no, for sure. so uh, and I'll be honest where I've really struggled with this as, as a whole and I wanted everybody to be treated fair but it's always bothered me uh, that golf courses, camp, we're losing money. We've got so many apps and so many programs that money, a million dollars could go so far in helping 
a wellness program out. It could go so far helping housing out, right? So since I took this role, I wanted to try and get the golf courses and campgrounds to, to a break-even point. Because uh, at the end of the day, this is all taxpayers of PEI are paying for these courses, whether they golf on them or not. And uh, they've got to be feasible. They're, they're, great, they're a great employer. But at the same time, the whole thought of these losing money when I know there's so many other programs that these could go to has always always bothered me. So we're, we're, I think it's the right, right decision. At the same time, I know there's, there's some angry golfers uh, regarding it, but there's also a lot of happy golfers because they're going to be able to get more, out more than they did last year. Charles, I want to throw it to you. And then, yeah, I mean, it's, we, we, we kind of differ on this potentially, but I understand. I appreciate the minister making that, but I think this is too much, too quick. But, but you will probably, and you should break even. These numbers should allow the golf courses to, to, to break even if that's what your goal is. My goal is to get more Islanders playing on them at a, at a, so, but they can attain and use some of the best golf courses in, in Canada. I do not want to see Islanders priced out of their own golf courses. No, and I don't remember what I can tell you. We've done a jurisdictional scan, and Crowbush is one of the lowest priced golf courses, uh, as well as Broodnell and Dunderave in the country uh, for condition. And I'm talking 50 cents on the dollar. I was quite amazed of how cheap it is to golf in them luxury courses compared to the rest of the country. Charles, how much royalty? Yeah, you, you're correct with that, and it's a competitive market. But there's been years where people you couldn't, you could, uh, you could drive a car on Crowbush some days because there was nobody playing it. Now they're playing it, so that that moves with the time, obviously. So, um, but no, I appreciate this debate. I don't want to take up any more time, but you know, you know how I feel. I'm just worried. I'm just worried about those Islanders who want to do this for wellness purposes. So, no, I agree. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Montague Kilmure. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to jump in on the debate as well. Um, with one of the courses uh, being close to my district and um, at the time when the changes were made I had gotten a, a handful of phone calls that were negative but you usually only hear the negative and I'll be honest um, you know we had discussed it and uh, but there was also quite a few people on the other side that were very happy with the changes even just uh, last week I refereed a hockey game and the, the two uh, the two people that were on with me um, I thought actually they would be against the changes because they're under 30, they're younger, you know, perhaps maybe not quite able to afford it. But they said, no, these changes are great. Like it, those members were eating up so much, so many tea times that now we'll actually get to get out. And uh, and I know that I, the, the email came out um, where you, I think you're getting under 30 and under 20% off and 64 yep. plus and then in between 15% off. So I think that was a... That was excellent. Um, people were quite happy with it, and you know, and the residents of well, PEI and but especially Kings County are you know, we're very pleased that we're able to golf on two of the finest courses in Canada, and probably probably in the world. So um, they do appreciate that they do need to pay to to play. And I just wanted to say that uh, thank you, Minister, for looking. You know. You did because they did come down. They they did come with a discount, and I think that was a able to meet in the middle. And yep. everyone at the end of the day, I think, is fairly happy. I haven't heard anything negative since, so I Good. just wanted to say that. Good question. Thank you. It's, it's a great question. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Shall I section carry? Carry. Total corporate services nine million nine hundred thirty-two thousand eight hundred. Shall I carry? carry? Strategic initiatives. Strategy and evaluation appropriations provided for a strategic planning, industrial, industry uh, investment, evaluation, and research services. Administration 7,700. Material supplies and services 5,600. Professional services 293,000. Salaries 704,700. Travel and training 5,600. Grants 3,669,100. Total uh, strategy and evaluation 4,685,700. Time Valley Sherbrooke. So there are a number of research projects funded under professional services. Can you elaborate a bit or tell us a little bit about what uh, some of these projects? So I see like PEI brand research, uh, study on additional revenue streams, COVID research. We don't have any details in front of us on that, Honourable Member, but I can get the Department to bring that back. Time about a share book. Okay. Um, I mean, I would love to to see any anything that was yep. produced from that research. Certainly, if you have, you know, a report or something, I'd 
Yeah, I'll take yeah, back any, whatever, any reports whatever on that I can take. I would, I would yep. love to have a look at it. So great. Right. Okay. I'm talking about a sure book. Um, so how you know I'm wondering about um, what your projections are for visitors, uh, expected uh, number of visitors uh, this tourism season. I don't have the exact number, but what I can tell you uh, is it looks like we're going to have a, a very successful tourism season. Um, bookings, uh, airfare, everything is is. Uh, 2019 numbers right now as of to date. Uh, optimism's high uh, in the tourism industry the first time in two years because they've uh, uh, they've been hit hard, obviously harder than than anybody. Um, yeah, I don't have the exact number in front, but I, I will bring bring that back. Uh, but what I can tell you just from talking to tourism operators, uh, Tai Pai, the chambers. Um, everybody seems to see the bookings coming in. Uh, a lot of things are, are coming back to, to the way they are. So we're, we're all hoping that that's going to be the case. Cruise ships are coming back, uh, which is going to be significant for uh, Charlotte Town and parts of Prince Edward Island. So uh, we're on the right track, and uh, we'll have. Uh, I'll try and get the projected numbers. I just don't have them in front of me. Hi, Valley Sherbrooke. And so you mentioned cruise ships. So mm -hmm. you know, I'm hearing some you know really mixed sort of uh, thoughts or concerns, and, and also excitement about cruise ships. Certainly from businesses, some businesses, um, but also concerns, you know, from Islanders. Uh, you know, I'm wondering if there will be any additional measures put in place uh, related to COVID uh, with cruise ships returning. Well, what, what I can tell you is, uh, from my understanding, that anybody on a cruise ship now has to be double vaccinated and tested before they get on the cruise ship. Um, so at the same time, when, when they land, uh, we're, we're confident that it, everything's going to, to work well, because um, a lot of the protocols are, are being done before these people get on the ship. Um, obviously, there's still uh, still going to be work to be done done in our end, but uh, we're, we're confident that uh, with the, the procedures the cruise ships have in place, it, uh, everything should work. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And so are we just, you know, trusting then that, you know, all cruise ship companies will have done their due diligence in ensuring that all passengers have uh, their, you know, full vaccination and uh, um, and, and all of, all of the, everything they need? Or are you going to be doing some checking at the ports of entry? That would be out of uh, provincial jurisdiction. So the cruise ships would fall under federal lease. So I'm guessing the federal government would have very strong mandate uh, with the cruise ships. Um, I would be quite confident saying that uh, that the federal government has been working with the cruise industry. So um, I can bring back info what uh, what that looks like. But uh, that's what I'm being told that if you're not double vaccinated and testing negative, you're not getting on a ship. Hi, Valley Sherbrooke. And so, has uh, your department um, or you know tourism PEI had any discussions with CPHO about how it will? Um, deal with any additional pressures that might result uh, from the tourist season, so cruise ships, but also, uh, you know, additional people coming to yep. the island. It's going to be pressure on our health care system. Um, have you had any of those discussions? Yeah, so the department has worked closely with CPHO all during COVID with, with everything, and uh, there's been a good relationship there. So uh, I know tourism is in constant contact with CPHO, uh, projections given numbers and what it looks like, and, uh, and I'm confident we're, we're on the right path. Um, I think we're going to have a very successful tourism season, and it, it's needed here right now because a, a lot of them businesses uh, had a rough time over the last couple of years. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And, uh, you know, in those discussions with, with CPHO, I mean, I'm wondering if there's any discussion about, uh, you know, any changes around uh, self-isolation guidelines or masking guidelines or different guidelines that would be, uh, you know, impact our tourism industry in different ways? That would be a, probably a question for health, so I'm not privy to any of that myself, but uh, when the health budget gets to Florida, that might be a, a question that can be asked. Time Valley Sherbrooke. So the 2022-2023 uh, tourism strategy, um, it talks about um, uh, the development of, uh, of investment in sport tourism as, as part of that strategy, and uh, I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about, about sport tourism and what you're hoping to achieve uh, in that area. Yeah, certainly. So uh, a lot of the sport tourism, not only summer, but we're looking to do uh, year-round tourism. So that's one thing that uh, 
I guess we could have always done better in PEI, especially during the winter and, and spring, is uh, is the, the tourism side of it there. Uh, there's a big market right now in sports tourism. Uh, this has come from industry as a whole, as well as the, the board. Uh, one thing I can say that COVID has done is brought uh, tourism operators and uh, organizations tied by uh, chambers to, to the table with, with input. And I find it's probably the, the first time in a long time that industry and government are working well together. So it's aligning up with what uh, the tourism industry wants and, and we're helping through. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Sure, okay. Um, I'm also uh, wondering about the recommendation, um, sorry, an action in the strategy, not recommendation, in the uh, action item in the tourism strategy to modernize the Tourism Industry Act. So, um, you know, can you tell us if you identify, has your department identified issues with the act and will we be seeing any amendments coming forward soon? I don't have that information with me, but I'll bring that back. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Sure, okay. Um, and another goal in the strategy, uh, investment and support for PEI is a premier meetings and conventions destination. So uh, wondering, you know, are meetings and conventions starting to recover? Because that, I imagine, would be one of the, the most challenging areas, yeah. uh, gathering people together. It was. It was a tough two years on the meetings and conventions. But uh, the last conversation I had was about six weeks ago, and there's a significant amount of bookings that are starting to come in, so it's very positive. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And one of the other things that's becoming more popular, I've found, is that uh, having these hybrid sort of approaches to uh, conventions and meetings yep. where people can choose to attend virtually and also or in person, and you can have both. But that requires, of course, you know, technology and perhaps training on how to use those technologies. Is there any funding available for, um, you know, meeting and convention, uh, uh, you know, businesses to, uh, to engage in that sort of either training or new technology? I would think there is. I, I'm not familiar where it would be at, but I know uh, that is being done now. Um, so, like I say, in the meeting I had six weeks ago, it's it's a thing of the future, um, and there's a big big need for it, a big demand. So, um, I don't think there's anything in this budget with that, but uh, but I know there there's definitely support there to uh, to make it happen. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Um. Uh. So okay. Um. And of course, we we lost you know several high profile events in 2020 that were scheduled to come you know to PEI. Um, uh, but we were able also to attract some other events uh, due to the Atlantic bubble and low case counts and that also yeah, opened up kind of a, a new sort of uh, um, way for us to promote ourselves as, as you know, this um, safe uh, place uh, to have these sorts of events and meetings. So are, I mean, are you at all concerned uh, that uh, with the high case counts we're seeing right now that we will have lost that can advantage? No, not at all. The bookings are showing that now. People are ready to travel. Um, PEI is the place that they want to be and, uh, and they're coming. So uh, this is the first time in years that bookings have been this filled uh, this time of year. So it's a good sign. Hi, Valley Sherbrooke. And the, uh, so kind of staying on this theme of the tourism strategy. So it also talks about, uh, you know, PEI's a greening agenda with sort of eco-friendly tourism and investing in eco-friendly tourism. So can you tell me a little bit um, about, you know, what sorts of products and experiences would fall under this eco-friendly tourism and what new investments? Because um, I think, you know, it sounds like a great idea. Yeah, it is. I don't have the, the details in front of me, but I, I can bring that uh, that back. Uh, that's definitely part of it. Adventure tourism is a part of it. There's many uh, parts that have been focused on the, on the strategic plan as well as, uh, as well as just industry as a whole. Um, so, yeah, I can bring all those details back. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And I was also wondering as well about uh, something else that was mentioned in the strategy about the uh, the potential for uh, regional tourism um, cluster development. So working with our, our neighboring province, provinces, I'm assuming that's what that means. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, our uh, you know provincial governments working together can. There's a lot of barriers to that being successful, but I do think it, it, there's a lot of barriers where we could certainly benefit from doing that more successfully. Um, where where are you at in terms of uh, developing a regional strategy and working with the other provinces? I know there's some upcoming meetings coming up, uh, but what I can say is we're focused on Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. They are two of our biggest markets. Uh, they have been in the past and they will continue to be. Uh, so we need to continue uh, attracting those visitors here as, as well as some. Um, I know my CEO and my department have been uh, have been meeting uh, with uh, regional reps, but uh, I don't have the details in front of me, but I can also bring that back. Time Valley Sherbrooke. 
So just one last question on the uh, in this section and on the you know related to the tourism strategy. So the last action item really, um, I wasn't clear what it what it means, and I'm hoping you can provide some clarity. So invest in public private partnerships to transform crown assets into year round product. So what that is, we uh, it's more focus on our, our winter tourism. So uh, when we attract visitors here, we want there to be things to do, um, ski trails, walking trails, snowshoe trails. So we're looking to uh, to provide in certain rural areas, uh, certain areas that uh, that will attract those visitors down. Um, I'll use an example. Last year, I believe last year, the year before, uh, we started with uh, with a nice rink in the trail down in Broodnell area, which really attracted uh, a lot of the locals as well. But uh, it's going to attract uh, tourist visitors as well. So we're really just trying to be, cre be creative with uh, uh, with all our assets as well as some of the private assets of uh, of bringing people here to give them something to do in the winter time. Time Valley, Sherbrook. Yeah, just because when I see that type of language, it, it's sort of you know. Sort of a little maybe red flag goes up where I wonder, you know, is this? Are we talking about T threes? Are we talking about you know privatizing our public assets? No, in some absolutely, way? absolutely, absolutely not. not. Nope, not privatizing nothing. Nope. Fantastic. Okay. Time that's, Valley Sherbrooke. Uh, no, that's all, Chair. Thank you. So, Charlotte West Royalty. Yeah, I just want to ask um, uh, a couple of questions. So, we have a great. Uh, there's been a ton of work done on the island walk or the island. Um, trail and, and mm -hmm. some amazing results happening, and they're comparing that trail to be one of the one of the one of the best in Canada for sure. That's right. um, what, what is the strategy to help promote? It's been basically run by a, a group of, of volunteers, a successful group of volunteers. Yeah. What's the What's the province? What's the five year plan on that? So I don't have what a five year plan looks like, but what I can say is uh, the department is committed to continue working uh, with that organization as well as Cycle PEI. We have one of the biggest cycling PEI, or Cycle PEI is one of the biggest events uh, that, that we would have uh, on the cycling side of it. Uh, there's lots of great initiatives, so we're a funding partner that will continue to be their support and, uh, and help with these organizations. A uh, very passionate crew in my department that is working with these organizations to get them across the finish line. Cheryl Thomas Royalty. And that, that seems like, I, I just want to maybe, if we can, push it forward and, 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 and get more money into that because I think it's, it's going to showcase Prince Edward Island in, in, a, in a wellness destination and, and we have something very, very, very special with that, I think. I mean, comparing it to, to trails in, in Spain for people like yep. going and how many thousands of people use the El Camino Trail in Spain. And I mean, that's just a little bit of a, you know, comparison, but but we can bring in people um, to this island in droves to, to use that trail. So I agree. If they're coming, we'll find more money. Yeah. Charles on West Royalty. And is there anything? I know we talked about adventure tourism, eco tourism, but it, in in my circles, with the, with the people that I'm talking to across the country, uh, wellness tourism or uh, is a big is a big thing. They're getting a lot of people to come to different places where they're to be healthy on their vacations. Yep. To um, is there any sense that we can use our beaches and our trail systems to to do that collectively? I would think so. So a lot of things that we are doing, like the walking, the cycling, uh, we're looking at the, the winter tourism, the snowshoeing, the skiing. But um, I wouldn't say necessarily we're calling it a, a wellness tourism, but it's it's along the same line. Um, I can go back to the department and, and see what we can, can do to work towards that. Charlotte and West Royalty? Yeah, no, and I just want to say, like, the, those are the, the packages that people are going on adventures in, in, in larger groups, and, and I think that's, that's, that's something that we can look at in the future. So thank you, Chair. Mr. Time Valley Sherbrooke? Just one more thing, sorry, that I've uh, forgotten about. Um, uh, just before we move on, the, uh, the island... Um, Island Walk, I believe that's what it's called, mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, something I'd asked the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, so it was brought to my attention that there might be some potentially um, dangerous areas along the, the road where that walk is kind of laid out in my district. I'm wondering if that's a conversation you've had with the, the Minister at all, just to, because we no. certainly want it to be a, a safe experience, no, first I, and foremost. I haven't, but I, I'll certainly follow up. Time Valley Sherbrooke. That's all. Thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Regulation and compliance, appropriations provided for management and administration of licensing, signage, and compliance. 
Administration, 4,600. Material supplies and services, 12,000. Professional services, 5,000. Salaries, 272,200. Travel and training, 8,300. Total regulation and compliance, 302,100. Shall the section carry? Time Valley Sherbrooke. So, okay. So, <clears throat> so there are three regulatory staff under this division. Um, can you explain uh, what these regulatory staff do? So they would make sure that the signage bylaws are being followed. Um, just in, as an example, just being a former realtor, so if I was to put uh, a real estate sign on the, the end of a road with an arrow for sale, this is their responsibility because I it would break the, the bylaw. So it's their uh, their basic compliance officers to make sure that the signage laws are being followed. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, and has um, you know in terms of the uh, capacity of those staff, I mean, is, has it has it pretty much been the same you know for years? Like, are or are, are they are they is that enough? To uh, I'm being told it's enough. Yep, that seems to seems to be enough. And if it, anytime it's not enough, I would be hearing from the director or CEO that it's not enough. Okay. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Um, all right, thank you, Chair. That's all for me. Shall the section carry? Sure. Oh, Charlotte on Belvedere. Thank you. Um, We've had some concerns, Chair, that there, um, including from the City of Charlottetown, that the province has been licensing short-term rentals that have not been approved by municipalities. Um, is there any action happening on resolving that? With that problem, mm -hmm. So what I can say is that we're continuing to put more resources and more than ever before to make sure that uh, short-term rentals are complying. Um, We've been proactive. Uh, we've uh, we've been sending out uh, warning letters. If you're not uh, obviously through COVID, we haven't been charging, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't shouldn't be licensed. We're still making sure it's being licensed. And uh, my commitment is that if uh, if somebody is not following and will not get licensed, that we will be charging. Charlotte Town Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. I guess the question is why is this issue happening? Like, how is it that somebody can be licensed when they're not? eligible to be licensed, like is a license issued without any kind of compliance check? Because that's what we're hearing from the city, that, that there are there are um, short-term rentals that <coughs> have not been approved, so they're in contravention of, they don't meet the, the, the compliance requirement okay. from the municipality, so they should never be licensed at all. I don't have that information in front of me, Honourable Member, but I will commit to check in and bring it back to, to see what I can find. But um, I know that the department is every day is making sure that these uh, these businesses are licensed, and if they're not licensed, they uh, they're getting warning letters, and if they don't uh, uh, get licensed after the warning letters, uh, then we're uh, we're we're fine. Charlton Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, and and, and um, Minister, it's not a new. Thing. This has been raised in, in public meetings at the city multiple times and yep. has been a part of a regular discussion in terms of the, the process of short-term regulation with the city of Charlottetown. So I, I would really hope that your, your staff and, are, and your, your team are kind of yeah, connecting. They are definitely connecting with it. I, uh, I just don't want to say the wrong thing and it be wrong. So I know they've been, been working on it and I don't want to bring it back to details. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Can you give us an update on how your department is um, regulating short-term rental platform operators like Airbnb and VRBO? Because that was, you know, we made that amendment under the Tourism Industry Act. And just sort of where, is, where are we at with the actual application of that, that change to the legislation? Yeah, so it's up and going, I believe. You're talking the compliance side of it? Yes. Yeah, I believe, don't quote me on this, maybe last October we, uh, we brought that in and started using it. I haven't got uh, an update, but uh, it's in use now, and, and I know the department is using it, and, uh, and uh, I believe that uh, we're, uh, we're really trying to focus on uh, uh, the, the short-term rentals that aren't licensed, and like I say, we're really slapping down on making sure that it gets done. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Part of the commitment of that um, um, legislation was, was that that data would be shared. Yes. Uh, and I know when we had the discussion at the time, yep. we were talking very much about how important it was to have that transparency. So, Minister, yep. would you be able to sort of look into when we could perhaps see? I definitely um, will. And obviously that is not the confidential data, but the, the overall yep. reporting numbers and sort of what, what are we learning from that from that regula regulatory process? Yeah, I'm committed to do that. I'll go back and see what I can find. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. I, I appreciate that commitment, Chair. I have another question. Um, a few years ago, the department entered into agreement, and I think it is compliance host, to track um, accommodations overall in the province, including short-term rentals. Is that agreement that that is that is still ongoing, or is that the one you're referring to now? 
Yeah, it's it's active. Charlotte on Belvedere. Okay, so the, the third party agreement is about tracking and providing that data. The other regulation that I that I mentioned was regarding the actual platform operators themselves. So it required them to comply. So for instance, Airbnb is required to, for instance, um, um, display the license number in the listing. Is is that in place, Minister? Okay. Charlotte on Belvedere. Thank you. Clearly, I don't check Airbnb that often, so <laughs> it's a, um, Chair. In place, okay. but I haven't got on myself, but I will verify that. Chair, yep, yeah, I would really appreciate if the, if the Minister could, could verify. So there's two different asks. So one of them is around the compliance host and the, and the reporting of that data for us and uh, to be able to sort of understand how that's being used to inform policy. Um, the second one is, is can we confirm that that regulation of the operators is happening? And then I guess my third one, which goes back to my original question, is are you sharing that data with municipalities? That I, I don't know. I'll have to follow up on the municipality side of it. Charlotte Helm Belvedere. Thank you, because that would really connect, Minister, to my original question around, around the, 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 the relationship. You know, I think what I've heard from those involved in the, the very long process of short-term regulation in the city has been that the challenge of kind of, kind of apples to apples comparison and, and, and obviously the city's trying to work inside a larger regulatory space. They have brought in, you know, what is going to be probably one of the most rigorous regulatory frameworks, should it go ahead, um, in the country. Um, and so making sure that that negotiation is happening with the province and, and that those things aren't tripping over each other is going to be really important from both a tourism provider aspect and from a regulatory aspect. Um, and so, you know, Minister, if there's anything at all that, that we can do to assist in, in those conversations, please don't hesitate to reach out to those representatives for Charlottetown. Happy to do so. Charlotte Town Belvedere. That's um, that's good for me for there. Thank you very much, Chair. Shall the section carry? Yeah. French services appropriations provided for projects under the Federal Provincial Promotion of Official Languages Agreement grants 138,900. Total French services 138,900. Shall it carry? Yeah. Total strategic initiatives 5,126,700. Shall it carry? Yeah. Tourism marketing communications, digital marketing, appropriations provided for customer relationship management, sales, packaging, and new product development. Administration, 700. Material supplies and services, 600. Salaries, 305,000. Integrated uh, tourism solution, 500,000. Total digital, digital marketing, 806,300. Diane Valley, so one of the biggest expenditures in this section is the book PEI license. Can you t mm -hmm. explain a bit um, about what this license covers? Sure. Mm -hmm. So what, yeah, high level, so what this book PEI, I believe it's been in between approximately 10, 12 years. Uh, so it helps uh, certain businesses on the booking side of it. What we've come to realize is that it's out of date. Out of date. Um, so this is the last year for this contract and uh, we're going uh, with a, a different option that will be uh, cheaper and uh, more, uh, I guess, easier, easier to navigate as well. Time Valley Sherbrooke. So I guess that would align with the tourism strategies um, focus right. on an updating um, exactly. uh, technology and information platform. So yep. that would be where that's happening. Okay. Time Valley Sherbrooke. All right, that's good. Uh, that's all. Thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Visitor services appropriations provided for tourism information, travel counseling, and visitor information center activities. Administration sixty thousand. Material supplies and services forty two thousand two hundred. Professional services nineteen thousand five hundred. Salaries eight hundred forty three thousand eight hundred. Travel and training twenty eight thousand two hundred. Total visitor services nine hundred ninety three thousand seven hundred. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Advertising and public relations appropriations provided to market Prince Edward Island tourism in the areas of advertising creative, advertising by and production, web marketing and consumer promotion. Administration 7,500, material supplies and services 4,041,700, professional services 957,600, salaries 434,500, travel and training 6,200, grants, Atlantic Canada Agreement on Tourism 120,000, total advertising and public relations 5,567,500. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Um, so I noticed there is a $767,000 increase in this section this year. Uh, can you explain what that money is going toward? 
So we've increased the budget um, to allow for year-round marketing campaigns and in addition to beefing up existing campaigns. So we have a couple of new flights going to Calgary, Edmonton, Hamilton. Um, so we're trying to target target those. Todd Valley Sherbrooke. Okay. Um, nope, that's that's it, Chair. Thank you. I have one question. Just with that mention, it was a question I mentioned in the House last week regarding the uh, swoop air coming in in May with three flights. Mm -hmm. And can you just, again, just elaborate on why that's now down to two flying from Toronto to Hamilton times a week? So I don't have a lot of detail on that, Honourable Member, other than uh, I'm being told that as uh, the season increases and more bookings that they will they will accommodate. So it's uh, subject to change? Subject to change. Okay, thank yep. you. Mer uh, Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Um, so I can't remember if it was last year's budget estimates or the year before, we were talking about basically procurement, right, of uh, having the marketing campaigns, so who gets those yep. contracts to do it. And I remember when we were talking about, we were speaking of, one of those contracts were given to a new, uh, British Columbia firm yep. out of Vancouver. Vancouver. Yep. And as part of that conversation, I, you had shared that not always the expertise is here, mm -hmm. but you'd like to see some way that you can assist yep. um, businesses here of how so, they can build yep. a better RFP response. Yep. So can you tell me where that stands? Yeah, so so what I can tell you is we have used uh, a lot of local firms for, for some of the smaller projects. Uh, where this kind of comes is the start over the last few years on a strategic plan and working with one company. Uh, the industry board basically has recommended this company because they they are the best in the business according to uh, what I'm being told. So I didn't get to decide basically who they, they talked with the industry as a whole uh, as well as as well as the board. But I did say uh, that we need to, to look at helping our local businesses out as well. So I don't have the names of the local companies we have used, but we certainly oh, we're here. We did use uh, uh, retrospective Hummingbird House Productions. Furrow, uh, Square Deal Productions, Alex Bruce, Confound. Uh, there's a list of about 20 on the photo side of it. Insight Marketing, Volume 18, Dunn Consulting, uh, VoiceOver 21, John Connolly, and Alicia Tony. So we have used uh, quite a bit of, of local okay. content. Mermaid Stratford. Okay, thanks, and I appreciate that. And I mean, one of the biggest, I guess, most of contention I have with the new Procurement Act is the fact that it doesn't cover services, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there is no real um, outline as to how a gov how government needs should go ahead and get X number of, of um, RFP like RFP retenders or whatever. Um, is there? Do you find that that have, so? Do you put anything out to tender whenever you're looking to partner with anybody, yeah. or how do you manage that? Because yes. it's not a requirement of you no. to do that, right? No. Y yes, we would depending on, on on what it is. I don't have a lot of a detail of what. Um, but yeah, we certainly do our RFPs, uh, but I'll, I'll get more of a formal something from the department of, of how, how, how we do it. Um, and like I say, a lot of it comes from, from industry as a whole. Um, there was a time where government made decisions. Now we listen to industry on the recommendations, right? And this is where I think it's really been able to help us out because um, we're, we're working with industry as a, as a whole on the needs. Mermaid Stratford. Okay. I'm good. Thank you, Chair. Shall a section carry? Yeah. Yeah. Media Relations Editorial. Appropriations provided for editorial services, familiarization, tour hosting, administration, 5,200, material supplies and services, 78,600, professional services, 17,000, salaries, 190,000, travel and training, 6,200, total media relations editorial, 297,000. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. So a quick question. Um, what is the difference between you know this section and the section above advertising and public relations? How is it separate? So this is actually hosting media that comes to the island versus the other would be promotional materials. But this is the cost of bringing media to the island and maybe touring them around. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. Uh, what, okay. That's, so what type of, can you tell me a bit just quickly about how that would work like what type of media who are we what is what is the goal in doing that I, I don't have the criteria for the media but we could bring that back but I, I do know that they could select some areas that they're that they're interested in I think they also have to have a certain <laughs> amount of following um, in order for us to to spend money to, to tour them around so but okay. we can take that info back 
Pine Valley Sherbrooke. And I just I do notice that there's less money budgeted for this section this year as well. So I don't know like is <laughs> is that sort of a, an approach that maybe you're moving away from or why would that be? Uh, we just have a small change in the current year the the material supplies and services tends to fluctuate from year to year so if we require more information or sorry more more funding there just based on the media that we attract then we'll allocate it time Valley Sherbrooke. that's all thank you chair shall it the section carry <coughs> fulfillment appropriations provided for media distribution administration eighty two thousand nine hundred material supplies and services four thousand nine hundred professional services sixteen thousand six hundred salaries one hundred thirty seven thousand three hundred travel and training four thousand two hundred total fulfillment two hundred forty five thousand nine hundred shall carry <coughs> publications appropriations provided for the production and printing of publications management of photo library and audio Go visual services, administration 1,800, material supplies and services 157,200, professional services 41,700, salaries 164,900, travel and training 2,700, total publication 368,300. Shall the section carry? Carry. Travel trade sales, appropriations provided for travel trade promotions and international development, administration 15,500, material supplies and services 181,600, salaries 174,300, travel and training 7,700, total travel trade sales 379,100. Sign Valley Sherbrooke. Just one question here, the um, uh, $673,000 increase this year, um, uh, what is that for? I don't see that here. Uh, Travel and train see. sale. Um, sorry, so in the estimates, uh, it looks like there's a significant increase. No? Just seeing. Maybe my Are you math looking is at a travel, trade, off. and sales total? Yes. The budget There's estimate, 368.3, budget estimates, 399.6. So budget estimate, uh, 7 million, oh, sorry, so for the total, um, tour. Oh, that's the total of oh, all, sorry, the, that's the, all the ones that we just yeah. went through that oh, relate to this sorry, section. Sorry. Nope, you're good, thanks. It shall section carry. Total tourism marketing communications, 8,657,800. Shall it carry? Carry. Total tourism PEI, 23,717,300. Shall it carry? Carry. The hour has been called. Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall carry? Mr. Speaker, as chair of the committee of the whole house, having under consideration the grant of supply to Her Majesty, I beg leave the report has made some progress, and I move um, the report of the committee be adopted. Shall it carry? Carry. The Honourable Member from Morrell. Donna and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the member from Cornwall Meadowbank that this house adjourn until March 31st at 1 o'clock in the p.m. Shall I carry? Carry.